last 18 months on, and tell you what we've been up to. Because obviously we haven't been able to do what we usually do. Generally, people come to see us, families come to see us at least once a year. And uh, we get to see you, to chat to you and to see how things are going. Unfortunately, for many of you, many of us, this has not been possible in the past 18 months. Um, however, we haven't just sat and done nothing and we have been pretty busy actually and um, so I wanted to highlight a few things that we've been working on um, and um, also that will set the scene for some of the presentations today. As, as Morel has said, uh, there will be opportunities for questions after each talk and then there will be a panel this afternoon uh, where we'll be able to answer all, if not all, most questions, I hope, um, that you will have for us. Um, for me, I'm always excited about this Care Information Day because it, it is an opportunity for us to tell you about what we do and, and uh, the new advances in the field of frontal temporal dementia. And also just to have the opportunity for chat and this open forum for questions. Um, the, the, I'm, I'm grateful that we have Zoom uh, because we can still do something. Uh, however, it is frustrating because we're lacking these direct interactions, which makes this day always so interesting. Um, and when we started planning for this year's event, uh, we were hoping that we would have a face-to-face -face event. Unfortunately, this has not been the case. Um, and um, so our last face-to-face -face meeting was now two years ago, because last year we were part of the World FTD United Marathon Day uh, that some of you may have attended with talks from Australia, Europe, and the US. Um, so yes, this is our first day frontier, uh, focusing on, on frontier work in the past two years. Um, before I, I, I get any further, I wanted to thank Morel for coordinating today's events because that was a lot, lot of work uh, to put together and move to completely on Zoom, um, coming from face to face. Um, so yeah, challenging time for, for all of us and especially you families and uh, people working, living with frontal temporal dementia because obviously adapting to these changing guidelines almost every week is not easy. What can we do? What can't we do? Can we go outside? How many people? How far can we travel? Um, so it's, it's not an easy task and we're very mindful of that. What we've been trying to do over the past year or since the, the most recent lockdown is keep, keep in touch with some of you or many of you who would have come to see us during that time. And, um, and also just wanted to assure you that um, uh, uh, if you haven't heard from us, we, we, we know if you were scheduled to come to see us, we will be in touch with you very soon. If we haven't, get in touch with us. Um, and as we may have um, uh, forgotten a few people, but be, be, be sure that we are, still active we are working we are working very hard actually um, and uh, for, for new referrals and visits we are doing some of the assessments online using zoom when is when it is possible and also sending out questionnaires that many of you have filled out in previous um, in previous years um, New things that are on the horizon, first of all, our new website that uh, James Carrick put together with the help of many of us, and it's now live. And I think Muriel will have a slide with the, the details on it. Um, full of information for families, carers, but also clinicians and researchers. So it's a brand new revamped website, and I encourage you to have a look at it. We are also working on various mobile applications for clinicians that we're hoping to be able to release in the coming weeks that will help with the diagnosis. Um, 
with Kiri Ballard, we've um, developed a new clinic for people with language deficits. So it's a collaboration between the speech pathology unit here at Sydney University and Frontier. And also expanding that to collaborations with the, psych the School of Psychology or the Psychology Clinic to provide support for carers and uh, individuals with language disturbances, because we know that the um, many patients often will present with more than just language deficits when they have these, these presentation of front temporal dementia. Another aspect that is worth emphasizing is that there's a, a, a clear increase in the interest in developing clinical trials for frontal temporal dementia, and we are participating currently in, in four clinical trials. So this will ramp up as soon as we are able to see people again and recruit people directly. But I just wanted to flag this to you. Again, there will be more information on our website regarding this. Um, and so these clinical trials are um, sponsored by pharmaceutical companies based in the US, but also some that are initiated by collaborations in Australia with colleagues in, in Melbourne. Um, and also one that we are leading. Um, and so these um, clinical trials are in collaborations or are, are taking place at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, where um, um, Dr. Ahmed, Rebecca Ahmed, is um, directing the cognitive disorders clinics there. Other studies that we've been doing, we've been interested in the impact of COVID on, um, on people with dementia and also the impact of COVID on carers of people living with dementia. And I uh, just wanted to flag a study by Grace Way, one of our PhD students who's uh, been very active in this field. Again, we will have more information on these studies, clinical trials and many studies that we're running on our website. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight a couple. Um, and also, we, we, we are very busy collaborating with our international partners. We, are, we have a large study involving the many European partners in Italy, the Netherlands, in Germany, um, and in Canada, looking at improving the diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia and how we can differentiate FTD from other psychiatric disorders, which may present in the same way. And I think that will um, um, uh, lead on nicely to what Emma is going to talk to us about. Um, but really, for, for, for me, for us, uh, we, we, one critical issue that we're still working on is a, a, that of diagnosis. And, I also wanted to flag how can we improve the diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia? How can we um, identify people early in the disease process so we can provide the right um, diagnosis, the right support for people with the diagnosis, but also for their families? And I just wanted to flag the, I'm just going to share my screen here for, for a minute, but the, um, the ads that the American FTD Association put up in the New York Times on the weekend. I don't know if, if many of you would have seen that, but uh, that encapsulates very nicely the, um, that, that, that issue that, um, that is um, around the diagnosis of, of FTD. I hope you can see this. Um, but essentially, there's, there's how can we identify that quickly. His wife said it was midlife crisis. His therapist said it was depression. His doctors said it was Alzheimer's disease and no one said FTD. And this is the issue. Um, not many people still know about frontal temporal dementia. When people think about Alzheimer's uh, dementia, they think um, a disease of older people and more often Alzheimer's disease. And as you know, as we know, this is not always the case. And this is what, why we're doing this work. All right, I'll stop here um, because I'm not the interesting person here. And there'll be many, many interesting talks today. And again, there'll be an option for questions. 
And um, again, I'll be here for the Q&A this afternoon with um, a few other people. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you, Olivier. So, like Olivier start, said, we'll get started with um, some of the more um, interesting talks of the day. So I'd like to invite now Dr. Emma Deveni uh, to present. So Emma is a neurologist and an NHMRC research fellow here at the University of Sydney. She has clinical and research interests in all neurodegenerative diseases such as um, FTD. And today she will present on recent research that she has done on the overlap between FTD and psychiatric disorders. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Morel. <clears throat> I'll just share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. And um, so, yeah, thanks for coming along and um, for listening to this talk. I'm going to today talk about the overlap um, between psychiatric disorders and frontotemporal dementia. Um, I guess this is a sort of evolving area of interest, and one that I've been become interested in over, over time and really working towards building a research program, I guess, to try and help us um, understand this overlap more. And also, how can we harness this overlap to kind of improve diagnostic processes and that will in turn hopefully improve quality of life um, for people with dementia. So just to get started, because there's quite a lot to cover. So um, let's see how we go. So I guess just to try and introduce the idea of this sort of FTD psychiatric overlap. So traditionally we will have thought of frontotemporal dementia as a neurodegenerative condition, quite distinct from psychiatric disorders, but we're learning more all the time. And we know that there's actually so much overlap between these conditions. The most obvious area of overlap is in symptoms. Um, so many of the symptoms that present in FTD actually present in many psychiatric disorders. And often early on, it can be really difficult to disentangle these. And this is what I mean by here by um, phenotype. So the clinical phenotype, and what I mean by that is how the person presents when they come to see their doctor can often look really, really similar in frontotemporal dementia and psychiatric disorders. So as you can imagine, that leads to significant issues with diagnosis. And here is one of the kind of biggest dilemmas in um, FTD research at the moment, because we know that in, particularly in very difficult complex cases, there can be a diagnostic delay of up to six years, which is really remarkable and far too long, because during that time, not only are people and their families struggling um, to find the correct diagnosis, they're also not being able to access the appropriate care and support. We also know that at least 50% of um, patients and their families will have gone to see at least three clinicians in the build up to the diagnosis. So this is an area where we definitely can make lots of improvements. And the other area um, where there's overlap is actually, and this makes it even more complicated, is that these conditions can go coexist together. So not only are we trying to disentangle the symptoms to work out is this frontotemporal dementia or psychiatric disorder, but actually they can both coexist and probably it's estimated in about 25% of cases of FTD, there's a coexisting psychiatric disorder. Sometimes the psychiatric disorders can happen early in life. Sometimes they can be later and they can precede the conditions. And that raises the issue of perhaps this is um, actually a risk factor for frontotemporal dementia. So there's lots of areas that we try currently trying to work out. And when I talk about psychiatric disorders, just to give you some examples, I'm sure you're all aware, they are really quite broad and they encompass mood disorders, schizophrenia, autism, spectrum disorders. I'm going to take a step back, though. I just want to remind you, um, I'm sure most of you are all aware of the different types of frontotemporal dementia. Um, so it's the most common form of young onset dementia. Behavioural variant is the most common type, and it's here where there are marked behavioural and personality changes. And it's this type of FTD that where there really is a difficulty in differentiating from psychiatric disorders. Semantic dementia is one of the language variants. This is usually easier to diagnose, but in some cases, particularly when the right side is involved, there can be marked behavioral impairment. And again, in these cases, there can be overlap with psychiatric disorders. 
Progressive non-fluent aphasia is another language disorder. This time the speech is non-fluent. Usually behavioral and personality changes come as the disease progresses. But certainly I know a number of these patients, and this hasn't really been looked at formally, but often a number of these patients have initially been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. So there's definitely room for improvement across all the, all the phenotypes. But really, I guess I will focus some of this talk on the behavioral variant type, just because that's where we see the marked overlap in symptoms. And when I say symptoms, I mean the behavioral change and the cognitive changes. Um, so just to recap some of the key diagnostic features of um, behavioral variant FTD is disinhibition, such as difficulty um, with manners, perhaps, um, not understanding social cues, knowing when to take your turn in conversations, apathy, which is usually very marked in some cases um, with a loss of motivation. Stereotypy, so repetitive compulsive behaviors can become quite common. Um, change in eating preference is also very common and often patients will develop a sweet tooth. And loss of sympathy and empathy, which obviously can be quite devastating for everyone involved. The cognitive profile um, reflects the impairment of the frontal and temporal lobes. So we see executive impairments. And what we mean by that is problems with organization and planning. We also actually see some problems with memory, and that can make it difficult to diagnose, difficult diagnosis between Alzheimer's disease in some cases. Um, and also we see problems with um, social cognitive skills. But there are also a host of other um, symptoms, as you're I'm sure you're aware. They include psychosis, um, such as delusions and hallucinations, and um, paranoia, rigidity, um, impulsivity and agitation. So really, uh, uh, there's a marked array of um, behavioral and cognitive factors involved. Okay, so just to give you an idea of how these syndromes overlap. So let's take frontal temporal dementia. And we think about depression. And there is a lot of overlap here in terms of symptoms. Both conditions can present with apathy, um, patients with dementia can develop psychotic symptoms, particularly a psychotic depression, in some cases a postpartum depression, um, paranoia and agitation, common in both conditions. When we think about bipolar disorder, um, disinhibition is um, common, manic episodes, delusions of grandeur, again, all symptoms that can happen in FTD. Autism spectrum disorder, you might think of, which is more of a neurodevelopmental disorder, and this um, autism spectrum disorder actually overlaps quite a lot with frontal temporal dementia and is an area where we've been particularly interested in because they overlap in terms of stereotypical behaviors, these repulsive or com compulsive obsessive behaviors, um, and also have difficulties with empathy and social cognition. Another um, severe um, mental health disorder, schizophrenia schizophrenia has a lot of overlap too with FTD and particularly when it occurs later in life it can be very difficult to differentiate between the two as they share many symptoms including apathy, psychosis and difficulties with um, empathy and other emotion recognition. Finally um, obsessive compulsive disorder can often overlap as you can imagine in terms of the stereotypic behaviors. So I guess what I'm showing you here is trying to I guess, um, convey how difficult the diagnosis can be. Uh, and sometimes when, when you come to see us initially, these are some of the things that are going on in our minds when we're trying to work out what is the diagnosis here. And there's been very little research done in a lot of these psychiatric disorders when they happen in later life, which makes it even more difficult to disentangle this whole web. In terms of cognitive factors as well, as I say, social cognitive difficulties are really pervasive in autism, schizophrenia, and also FTD. And executive deficits are really pervasive across the entire spectrum. So while they are a core feature of FTD, they really don't often help us differentiate much. So this is to give you a bit of a sort of real life, I guess, um, understanding of how things um, work when, they, when people come to see us at the clinic. This is some data I've just been looking at from, from our clinic. And this is pretty consistent with what um, other centers have shown. 
So when someone comes to see us initially, at their first visit, these are people who've been referred with sort of typical frontal lobe symptoms. In about 40% of cases, we can be certain that the diagnosis is a behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia. But in seven, while in 17% of cases, we're often confident that this is a psychiatric disorder. But there is a large portion and where we're just uncertain. It's not clear they don't fit into, into any of the um, diagnostic criteria that we use. And we, that's why we like to follow people up. As you know, we'll often invite you to come back annually. And um, that can the follow-up can actually be really helpful for us. And at that stage, we're probably able to make a more definite diagnosis in about half of people. And the other half, um, you may have heard the term phenocopy, and these are people who tend not to progress over time. Or um, alternatively, we may at that stage still be considering a psychiatric disorder. So I guess that maybe starts to get build a sense of how this, these diagnostic processes um, are complicated. And certainly there's a lot of room for improvement. To briefly mention the phenocopy syndrome, and um, this is probably um, within the realms of, well, we're still uncertain, maybe within the realms of a psychiatric disorder. Um, it may, we have many theories as to what the cause is, but we haven't just really been able to, to tie that down yet. We know that these people are usually males in their 50s and they tend to not progress over time. And actually we know um, that these patients don't have typical FTD pathology. So what we have been able to work out some clues that can help us make a definitive frontal temporal dementia and that's been from research and um, that you all have participated in and this has been really helpful at a, at a base clinical level to help us make these um, difficult diagnoses and to give us more confidence in making them and something I want to touch on now and really I guess is a significant part of the overlap between FTD and psychiatric disorders is that what we found was that if patients had a positive family history of FTD, motor neuron disease, Parkinson's disease or psychiatric illness, then this was a clue to, uh, to a frontal temporal dementia diagnosis as opposed to a psychiatric diagnosis. And that got us thinking about, well, do psychotic symptoms happen in FTD? And the answer to that really came this is way back at the very start when I first came to Frontier and they just discovered the C9 or 72 expansion. I'm sure you probably have all heard about that by now. This is the most common, this was a groundbreaking discovery. This is the most common genetic abnormality in frontal temporal dementia. You can see down on the right of the screen, these are from our, from our clinic. Again, data that you've all um, contributed to for which we're so grateful and we see that about almost 35% of our cases carry this genetic abnormality. And interestingly, when I went to look at the data on our patients, I was overwhelmed by the fact that a significant proportion of these carriers experienced psychotic symptoms when they first presented to the clinic. That got us to think about how common are psychotic symptoms across the spectrum. When I say psychotic symptoms, I mean delusions and hallucinations. And as you can see, they're particularly common in the C9 expansion carriers as we expected, but they're also really quite common in frontal temporal dementia in general. And that's not something we've always been aware of. And I think that's because they're usually not as severe as the other symptoms. So while they're there, they often may not be as severe. Certainly they don't seem to trouble the patient um, as much, and that may be why we haven't been aware of them just as much up until now. And we see that when we look at all the different types of dementias, really they are most common in the frontal temporal dementias. But what do they look like? So you might wonder, um, what should I look for? Or, you know, what's that, what sort of symptoms might constitute a delusion or hallucination? Well, delusions, um, were persecutory in 45% of cases. So it's not unusual um, for people to perhaps believe that someone is trying to get them. Someone might be trying to break into their house to steal their things. It's quite a common delusion. Somatic delusions are really common in this group. And in that case, 
Um, sometimes patients will um, believe that there's something wrong with their internal bodily systems or perhaps someone's controlling that. Grandiose delusions occurred in 22% of, of people. And in those type of delusions, people often have um, kind of inflated ideas about their current life, what they've done, um, or maybe awards that they've won. And in some cases, people can have delusions of jealousy. And I guess that often is, this, that often is directed towards the partner. Um, so I guess that's something to, to bear in mind uh, if that has happened to you. It, it is always extremely distressing um, and um, is usually part of the disease process. And these, I must say, usually happen early in the disease process. So perhaps even before some of the other symptoms have come to the fore. So it may not be obvious at this stage that people have frontotemporal dementia. Hallucinations, visual hallucinations and auditory hallucinations were common. Common When they were visual, it was often of seeing, seeing animals or seeing dead people. Auditory was usually negative in nature too. Um, in some cases, it was the devil or some other sort of negative um, force that was talking to them. Again, though, I must say often um, patients did not find this very distressing, which is obviously reassuring. Um, then finally, about 15% of um, patients reported having um, hallucinations of touch. So they believe that they were touched by someone or in some cases that there were um, insects or animals and crawling under their skin. But when we look at all of this, Actually, what's been one of the most interesting findings is that we find that when people have these delusions and hallucinations, often these patients survive longer than people without these symptoms. Now, the underlying reason for that is, is not clear, and that's something that's been very exciting, an exciting finding, because it points to the fact that maybe in some way we might be able to kind of harness this to improve um, prognosis for patients with FTD, and we're trying to work out what it is um, that's causing this improvement in survival. But what's causing these psychotic symptoms? Well, we've been able to show that there are specific brain regions involved in harnessing or generating these psychotic symptoms. And certainly that's probably one reason why people experience these. And it got, it got me to think about you know, how the brain regions all work together and, and some, of, um, some of the really sort of vital um, processing capacity that we have is probably involved in generating these symptoms. Particularly, um, we find that um, abnormal sensory processing, and this is something very new, and we've only just um, published this, um, but certainly it's helping us understand why do some people um, experience psychotic symptoms when others perhaps don't. And it may be because of some difficulties in this part of the brain that processes senses. And we've shown also that um, as, for example, in, so we looked at all of the five senses and we found a similar pattern. But what we saw when we looked at smell, so how we tested smell was we asked people to, and some of you might remember doing this, we asked people to sniff, sniff do a sniff test. And we also give people a questionnaire. And we find that as, um, as our patients smell and deteriorated, which happens in neurodegenerative diseases, um, their abnormal perception of smell increased. So this has been giving us some insight into what also might be driving um, these abnormal um, sensations that patients are experiencing. And we've also shown that in, when we look at the brain scans, So I want to move on now and um, talk a little bit about, as I mentioned to you, we've sort of talked about the symptoms, we've talked about the diagnosis, diagnostic problems, how these conditions overlap and, um, and what we can do perhaps to improve it um, and what work we're already doing in that realm. But I just want to go a little bit back to um, what was happening before the disease or what are the risks what are the potential risk factors for developing a psychotic disorder? Um, and what we find is that having a personal history of psychiatric disorders, it's actually relatively common in our patient group. 
Um, and it seems to be particularly high in those who experience delusions and hallucinations. Interestingly, what we find also is that there are certain sort of biopsychosocial measures, as we would describe them, um, that seem to increase our patients' vulnerability to developing these symptoms. And they include social anxiety, social isolation, uh, and mood disorders. So, you know, this perhaps suggests that if we can, if we can target um, these factors that are very modifiable, we hope, and that perhaps we can improve maybe not only symptoms of psychosis, but perhaps other behavioral symptoms for many of our patients. And again, depression and social, social isolation were two of the factors that were most predictive of developing um, psychotic symptoms. Just to move on now briefly, so we've kind of talked about risk in terms of the individual, but we've also I've also been doing some work that looks at the risk for family members. So here, um, I looked at C9 carriers and compared them to non-carriers because I had a hint from some of my previous work that psychiatric disorders were more common in families who carried the C9 expansion. And as expected, that's what we find. Um, so across um, the board of psychiatric disorders, so we looked at schizophrenia, we looked at suicide, we looked at mood disorders, and we found for all except bipolar disorder that they were much more common in C9 carriers, in the family members of C9 carriers. So for example, in schizophrenia, example, our patients who carried the C9 gene, their family members had an eight times increased risk of um, having a diagnosis of schizophrenia than our patients without without the um, expansion. So we have a lot more work to do in this field. Um, we also have shown a similar pattern for autism spectrum disorder. Um, but again, as I say, we have a lot of work to do here and that sort of feeds into part of, of some of the other studies um, that I've been working on. And certainly um, COVID has obviously disrupted some of this work, but um, in the near future, you may be hearing from me, um, we've developed an online survey to try and understand these sort of pre-manifest um, manifesting psychiatric disorders and symptoms um, in our patients and their families. So this is just a, an example, I guess, um, of a family tree of um, a typical sort of C9 or 72 carrier family. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see it here, but basically what it shows is really that there's such marked variability in terms of the disorders within families. Um, so in some families, um, it, can, it can be predominated by motor neuron disease and frontotemporal dementia, as we would expect. But in other families, there, you know, there are quite high rates of other psychiatric disorders. Finally, I just want to um, mention, um, so myself and some of the other members of the team here have been and continue to be involved in an international effort to try and address these issues. Um, we do all, you know, I think there's definitely merit in looking at this from an international level where we can bring together all of our combined um, expertise. And we've recently, um, published a paper that tries to help clinicians um, distinguish between behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia and psychiatric disorders. And some of the work that we have um, conducted here at Frontier has, is part, has made up part of these um, consensus criteria. As part of that, um, a neuropsychiatric international consortium has also been formed. So to help us all work together to address these really important um, aspects of frontal temporal dementia. So finally, I hope I've given you a little insight into what I call this neurodegenerative neuropsychiatric spectrum and shown the significant overlap across conditions to try to give you an understanding of how this results in delay to diagnosis. I hope also kind of raised awareness of how 
psychotic symptoms and perceptual changes can occur in frontotemporal dementia, and how we're working towards identifying what is the cause of this. And some of this may well hold the key to understanding how survival is improved in these patients, and this hopefully might lead to some other interventions in the future. Certainly, this work has already generated some results that help us diagnose FTD earlier. I guess we've also um, kind of covered some of the social factors um, that might be involved in psychotic symptoms that might be amenable to um, intervention. And also talked about the family members at risk for other psychiatric disorders. And certainly that has implications um, in terms of genetic testing. And that's something um, that we have advised on as well regarding that. And overall, um, we, I hope this work will ultimately identify targets and for potential interventional therapies and also allow us to kind of cross specialties and collaborate and work with psychiatry to kind of help us to move towards um, improved diagnosis, improved um, support, improved access to support um, for patients and carers alike. So as part of my acknowledgements today, I just really want to focus on um, thanking the patients and their carers at the clinic. None of this work um, would have been possible without all of your um, patience and dedication. And I am so very grateful. Um, and obviously, I also want to acknowledge the entire Forefront team um, that have all worked um, together to sort of generate um, this data. So thank you. Um, and if there's any questions. Thank you, Emma. That was really, really interesting and comprehensive. Um, so whilst we, whilst we wait for questions, I actually had a question just to start. You had mentioned in your talk that um, you know, you're seeing this link between psychotic symptoms and survival in FTD. Uh, would you mind explaining a little bit more about this emerging correlation that's here? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Well, I guess, as I said, this is a relatively new finding. Um, and, I, you know, obviously we'll interpret it with caution. It's the first time that you know, any, we've really come across this. And the next step is really trying to work out where, that, where this comes from. You know, I don't believe it's the psychology psychotic symptoms. The psychotic symptoms themselves are just a manifestation of something that's going on in the brain. Um, but whether this this might be simply that if you if you experience psychotic symptoms as part of your illness, then you tend to be picked up earlier, you know, and your onset is perhaps considered to be earlier. Or perhaps the other avenue that I'm exploring is it may be something, you know, potentially is it something to do with the treatment of of how we treat psychotic disorders? Um, is, it, is it something to do with the antipsychotic medication? Certainly they do have impacts on metabolism um, that we know is impaired in FTD. This is you know, very much hypothetical at the moment, um, but something that we hope, we hope will, will you know, lead to, to something potentially important um, for people. Yeah, thank you, it's interesting that there's a link there yes. as well. Um, just another question, Emma. Um, when the in in those sort of very early stages um, uh, of before a diagnosis, um, as a neurologist, when you're diagnosing, when it when it when it's unclear like that in the very early stages, do you tend to err on the side of psychiatric, you know, di diagnosing as a psychiatric condition or FTD? Where do you sort of um, lean towards yeah i mean I, I think it's it's always very difficult uh, not always very difficult sometimes i should say it's very obvious and it's very clear and it's easy for us to make to make that diagnosis often as you've seen from from the data that i've presented it's not usually that clear and and i think we've you know we've learned over time that it's uh, we've learned over time how complex it is so i think for how, you know, over time we've learned that it isn't as easy to make a diagnosis as perhaps was thought in the past. And often the more you know, the more complicated it becomes. Um, and I think we've also learned that, you know, making a wrong diagnosis early on can actually be really devastating for people in the future. So um, 
I think I think the the answer is trying to be um, trying to be open and honest with people, and you know, and explaining sort of the complexity of it. And I suppose depends, so many circumstances involved, but given it, I suppose an honest opinion, and you know, saying we really don't know, but based on this, this, and this, I think this is much more likely to be FTD or or a psychiatric disorder. Mm -hmm. All the kind of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's quite we're, that we're, conversation. Yeah, we're getting a few questions here uh, about smell. I'm not sure if you can uh, answer this, but okay. um, there's a there's a question here: is, is smell an early indicator of atrophy within the thalamic regions of the brain? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think that the smell circuits, you know, are actually um, are actually quite quite complex, and you know, and it's a network involved. You know, there can be you know, certainly you can start in the you know there's brainstem receptors for smell. There's also you know more local in, in the nose, and certainly, I mean, the thalamus is is involved in that sort of process, and certainly the thalamus is an area that I'm particularly interested in um, because it's it's involved in all of these sort of sensory processing um, events that take place in the body and and we know more and more that it seems to be involved in frontal temporal dementia so i'm not sure that we know exactly if it's an indicator of atrophy within a specific um one specific brain region um but certainly smell does seem to be an early indicator of neurodegeneration in general and i think it'll be interesting to see you know, as, as we see more of these um, studies come out of people before they develop the condition, so gene carriers who maybe don't have FTD yet, but they're in those early stages. I think as we start to see more of those studies come out, that may be able to give us a more definitive answer, but I certainly think it, it, it may well be, be a possibility. Okay, yes, because we're getting a few comments through the the chat here saying that smell, people know smell is something that's uh, impaired changes and wondering if that's an early indicator. Um, yeah, I think it is, yeah. All right, well, we might finish there. Thank you so much, Emma. And we might move on to the to the next talk now. Thanks. So, and thank you, thank you, Emma. Um, if, we, if there's more questions in the chat, we'll present these to the, to the panel later on this afternoon as well. So rest assured, you know, if, um, if your question wasn't answered, we'll, we'll present it to, to the rest of the speakers. So, um, I'll just get you to stop sharing screen, Emma, and then... Okay. So, um, next I'd like to invite Dr. Claire O'Connor uh, to present. So, hi, Claire. <laughs> So Claire, um, Claire is a research fellow at the Centre for Positive Aging at Hammond Care. She's also a lecturer at the University of New South Wales and also a registered occupational therapist. Um, and she worked with us at Frontier um, many years ago. Her research and clinical interests are, are currently in behaviour support and other non-pharmacological interventions. Um, that are aimed at maximising functioning and engagement uh, for people with FTD. And today she's going to tell us a little bit more about her program uh, and her research in behaviour support for people with FTD. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Morel. Can you guys see my slides okay? Yes? Yes, yes. Okay. Good, thank you. Before I get started, I'm just going to warn everyone that I've got two young kids and a dog in the house, so I apologise in advance if there's any strange noises that happen um, in the background. Okay. Um, so before I get started as well, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm sitting today, the Darug and Eora people. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be watching today. People with younger onset dementia frequently experience delays in receiving a diagnosis and this can impact on timely access to appropriate support and services. People with younger onset dementia often have unique challenges when compared to people with later onset dementia 
For example, they may be supporting younger children and also face the financial implications of unplanned early retirement. Behaviour changes such as apathy and disinhibition are relatively common in younger onset dementia and can add to the challenges already faced by family carers. In fact, when compared to later onset dementia, family carers of people living with younger onset dementia have identified greater challenges in coping with behaviour changes and higher levels of stress and depression. Despite the unique needs of these families, specific younger onset dementia support services are lacking. This lack of appropriate services and psychosocial support in younger onset dementia can negatively impact the health and quality of life of family carers and ultimately result in early transition to residential care. To better understand what might assist families living with younger onset dementia, we completed two studies. First, we conducted a survey to understand the needs of families living with younger onset dementia. And second, we conducted a pilot study where we trialled the use of positive behaviour support through education sessions with families who were supporting a family member with FTD. The aims of study one were to identify the presence, frequency, severity and care of stress related to behaviour changes in the person with younger onset dementia, to identify family care of confidence in identifying and implementing behaviour support strategies, to explore the strategies that families have been using to address behaviour changes and to understand the formal and informal supports and services families have used to address these behaviours. So in 2019, we mailed out a purpose-developed semi-structured survey to 230 families of individuals enrolled with Frontier. 71 surveys were returned in total, but the majority were from families living with behavioural variant FTD, semantic dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to focus on those three groups today. Over 90% of the family carers reported at least one difficult to manage behaviour and the four main behaviour domains were identified as aggression, compulsive behaviour, disinhibition and inappropriate social behaviour and apathy. And for disinhibition, there was a greater frequency of reported disinhibited behaviours in behavioural variant FTD than compared to Alzheimer's disease. Overall, Carers reported feeling somewhat confident in providing behaviour support, identifying why their family member exhibits behaviour and identifying the most appropriate behaviour support strategies. And while we didn't find any statistical differences between the groups, some different profiles were apparent. For example, almost 30% of semantic dementia carers indicated that they were not very confident with providing behaviour support. Almost a quarter of semantic dementia carers and more than a third of Alzheimer's carers reported being not very confident with identifying why their family member exhibits behaviours. And over 40% of semantic dementia carers and over a quarter of behavioural variant FTD carers reported being not very confident with identifying the most appropriate strategies to support behaviours. For the behaviour support strategies that family carers reported using, we analysed these according to preventative and responsive strategies. This allowed for comparisons with the principles of positive behaviour support, which emphasises preventative strategies based on the function of the behaviour. I'm going to talk a bit more about this when I talk about study two. So carers reported using a range of behaviour support strategies, and the majority of strategies reported by behavioural variant FTD carers were responsive. For example, doing something in response to the behaviour after it's happened. For semantic dementia carers, the strategic approach was more evenly distributed, with 51% being preventative. For example, modifying the environment, such as removing a trigger for a behaviour to try and prevent it from happening in the first place. And carers of people with Alzheimer's disease reported the lowest proportion of behaviour support strategies overall, and the majority of these were preventative. And finally, a range of formal support services were identified as being used by the carers and families. However, the specific relationship between these services and how they may have supported difficult to manage behaviours was not specified. And given the high rate of reported difficult to manage behaviours, a really concerning outcome from this study was that more than 40% of Alzheimer's carers, over a third of semantic dementia carers, and more than 20% of behavioural variant FTD carers did not report using any formal support services. Overall, the findings from study one indicate that families living with younger onset dementia are supporting a range of difficult to manage behaviours and carer confidence around providing behaviour support is variable. Families do have existing skills that do need to be recognised, but they would also benefit from improved access to tailored services that offer specific guidance in behaviour support that allows for long-term coaching and mentoring 
and promotes the well-being of the family carer as well as the person living with dementia. And that leads into the second study that I want to talk about. And so for study two, we ran a positive behaviour support education program with family carers of individuals diagnosed with behaviour wearing FTD. And the program involved a weekly session over four weeks that was delivered by a combination of face-to-face -face and online formats. So positive behaviour support or PBS is a recommended inter intervention approach for addressing difficult to manage behaviours with a focus on increasing quality of life. PBS has been shown to be effective in supporting people with a range of disability types, including dementia. The underlying assumption of PBS is that behaviours serve a function or purpose for the person. Once this is understood, a PBS plan can be developed, which includes a range of strategies from four key domains. Environmental strategies, addressing any mismatch between the person and their environment. So for example, a cluttered space may make it difficult for someone with dementia to do an activity and they may become frustrated. But if we clear away all the clutter and just lay out the activity materials, the person is much more likely to be able to do the activity without being becoming frustrated. Positive programming. So that's about teaching skills that are functionally related or equivalent to the behaviour. So for example, Harry's family carer identifies that whenever they do the grocery shopping, Harry has to unpack all the groceries himself in a really specific order and won't let anyone in the kitchen. And if Harry notices anything out of place in the kitchen, he gets really angry with the family members. And while the family finds this challenging, Harry's sorting skills can be harnessed by providing him with other appropriate sorting activities. That way, Harry has activities that he can engage in and be successful at, and the family has a way to redirect Harry and find positive ways to promote his abilities. And positive programming also involves coping strategies for the person and for the family as well. Focus support strategies, that involves controlling behaviour triggers and reinforcing desired behaviours. So an example of controlling a behaviour trigger might be, if Peter gets angry when asked to do something, instead of asking him to do a task, lay out the task materials for him, but don't ask him to do it. And Peter may then come across those materials and make his own decision to do the task. And finally, reactive strategies. So that's about reducing the impact of a behaviour when it is occurring. So for example, if your family member is swearing at you, try and remain calm and ignore it as best you can, rather than getting upset and potentially escalating the behaviour. And that is quite difficult to do. So for study two, we adapted a PBS education program that was initially developed for families supporting adults with brain injury, and we've adapted it for family carers of people with dementia. The purpose of this pilot study was to determine whether this program was acceptable and useful in addressing the family's behaviour support needs. We also aim to determine the feasibility of online delivery of the program, which is probably now more than important than ever given the impacts of the pandemic. We delivered the program to 10 family members. Over the four weeks, the sessions cover a range of topics, such as recognising the strengths of the person with dementia, being able to understand why behaviours change and then being able to analyse the specific behaviours expressed by a family member with dementia. The program promotes taking a systematic approach to understanding and analysing behaviours in order to develop specific strategies to either redirect or replace the difficult to manage behaviour with something more acceptable. And there's a really big focus on preventative strategies. So following the education sessions, families reported positive changes in the way they provided behaviour support but we didn't find any significant changes in the level of confidence reported by family carers. But families reported that they were now seeing behaviour changes as having a purpose or function, and they changed their own behaviour when responding to difficult to manage behaviours and were calmer in their approach. So our findings suggest that PBS education sessions are an acceptable approach for assisting family carers to provide behaviour support for family members with FTD, but this now needs to be confirmed in a larger study. In the meantime, this workbook that was developed is freely available and could be a useful resource to support health professionals working together with people living with younger onset dementia. And just as a big truck has driven past, I'm, I'm finishing, so that's good timing. Um, I'd just like to thank all the families who participated in the survey and the education sessions, uh, the Charles Perkins Centre and Forefront for making these projects possible. Um, and to acknowledge the other members of the research team. So without them, this work also wouldn't have been possible. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. 
Uh, and thank you for, for making that resource uh, freely available as well. Um, we'll post a link as to how people can access that. Um, so Claire, we've got one um, question from the audience here from Gemma. So Gemma asks, um, is there an implication or I guess relationship between where people live and what services are available to them? Uh, there absolutely would be in terms of face-to-face -face, um, allied health services that people could access for sure. Um, but again, looking at online delivery for things like this um, and what we found was that it was feasible to do that definitely opens up and creates more opportunities for people, particularly, you know, in regional remote areas. Um, but that is the nature of the healthcare system that people are sort of um, reliant on where the allied health teams are and what, um, how they work their services. Yeah, it's better in some areas, worse in others. Absolutely. Um, and Claire, we've got another question. I guess it's around this topic of um, obsessions, fixations that is common in uh, FTD. Um, Margaret asks, how can you, how can we deal with um, uh, managing obsessions? I mean, she's, she, Margaret has talked about obsessions with the car, but I think more broadly, uh, dealing with obsessions and fixations uh, with people with FTD. It's definitely um, not easy and sometimes, I mean, it's difficult to say what, you know, your specific situation is. I can't actually see the question myself. Um, but, yeah, um, sometimes it's about trying to see if you can maybe replace that behaviour, so not trying to eliminate it because it's not really, it's not often possible to just stop a behaviour from happening. Mm -hmm. But if you can transfer it to something that's more acceptable to the family um, in a safe way, then maybe trying to, to harness that. Like the sorting activity I talked about, you can sort of, re if you can redirect someone and use that obsession and just in a more appropriate way or acceptable way for the family, um, then sometimes that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. if so it's like what, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say if something's safe that someone's doing, um, you know, sometimes it's about just trying to pick your battles as well, depending on what the obsession is. Um, sometimes something might annoy us, um, but maybe it's, you know, we weigh it up and decide and just focus on um, really specific things that we really do want to change and then let other things go as much as we can as well. So it's just about weighing up what's safe and what we can hand, what we can cope with and what we definitely can't cope with anymore. So mm -hmm. the, the golden kind of phrase of pick your battles. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Is, yeah. Um, so it's more, so Claire's, it's more about sort of working with the behaviour, you know, trying to kind of, ask for the people around the person to change rather than you know have eliminating the behavior because that seems to not be possible really i think expecting to eliminate a behavior may not be possible in i mean some instances it might be um, but in in others it might not be um, a realistic expectation so looking at ways to sort of channel that maybe in a different more appropriate appropriate avenue might be um, the way to go I think another thing to remember is that behaviours often change over time. So um, what's happening for you now, you know, in a year or so might not be happening anymore as well. So it's always important to remember that, that um, things do change over time. So, yeah. Yeah, behaviour evolves. Yeah. Um, we might just ask one more question, um, Claire. So Julaine has written in, she said, my biggest frustration pretty much every day is shadowing. Um, but my husband seems genuinely fearful that I'm that if I'm gone, he cannot see me. Uh, do you recommend any strategies for shadowing? Um, yes, I would try and find some um, really specific activities that he might like to enjoy that you could try and start to engage him in. Um, but you'd have to select activities that fell within what his capabilities are. So I'd be looking at what his strengths are and what he's capable of at this point in time. Um, and then really trying to harness some things that are really interesting to him to try and get him engaged in that. Um, I've had some success with people in the past where similar things were happening and we found some activities that just really fit with that person. Um, and then 
Um, like for instance, one of the activities we chose for this person who was just following his wife around everywhere um, was a jigsaw puzzle because that was something that would have interested him. And we just had to make sure we got the right amount of pieces because if there were too many pieces, he would get really frustrated and walk away from it. And if there weren't enough pieces, he would get bored. Um, so for this person, his um, target number of jigsaw puzzle pieces was about a 200 piece puzzle at that point in time. Obviously things would change over time as his um, cognitive and thinking abilities changed. Um, but yeah, when we targeted that jigsaw puzzle activity to him and it had a picture on it that it was age appropriate that he was interested in, um, he actually then um, was that something that he could be given and he could actually spend some time doing that in the evenings, for instance, when she was just trying to get dinner on without him hovering over her. Um, that was something that was really useful to them. Yeah. So you can find activities like that, not necessarily a jigsaw puzzle, but whatever suits that your husband or anyone else who you're, um, anyone else is thinking of, um, trying to think about what someone, what has your person enjoyed in the past? What do they enjoy now? What are their current abilities and what might they be able to do? And then trying to sort of bring all that together and think about some activities. So brainstorming, don't discount something and say, oh, they won't be able to do that. But sometimes just brainstorm and write everything down that you think might be possible and then think about creatively maybe how I can get that person engaged in that activity. Yeah. That's really helpful, Claire. I think the, like one of the key messages there is make, being specific about it, you know, deciding how the right amount of puzzle pieces and the age and everything. So that's, I think that's really good. Um, so uh, we, might, we might leave it there, Claire. Thank you so much. And um, people that are sending in questions will we'll, uh, pose these, like I said, to the panel a bit later on. But thank you so much, Claire. No worries. Um, Thank you. See you later. All right. So um, when we'll move, we'll move along to our next talk, which is a change in pace, uh, moving more into the kind of language space of FTD. Um, I'd like to welcome now Professor Kiri Ballard to present. So once Kiri, there we go. Hi, Hi. Kiri. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, so I'll share my screen. Yes. Yeah, so this is this is Professor Kiri Ballard. Um, she is a professor of speech pathology here at the University of Sydney. Um, she's currently conducting research into the diagnosis and treatment of primary progressive aphasia, and she also runs the university, uh, the University of Sydney, the University's Progressive Aphasia Treatment Clinic. Um, and today she's going to provide you all with an overview of the best evidence uh, for speech and language treatments for uh, the progressive aphasias. So I'll hand it over to you, Kiri. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, yes, so we'll focus now on speech and language in primary progressive aphasia. So I understand not all of you may be interested in um, the aphasia component, but hopefully a good number. Uh, Sorry, let me just click on that. So what I'm going to cover today is an overview of research into treatments for primary progressive aphasia and also um, a couple of new uh, emerging approaches to treatment that have just recently gained attention. And then a little bit about our uh, PPA communication project, which is the clinic that was mentioned by Morel and by uh, Professor Piguet earlier. So primary progressive aphasia, I think um, most of you will know, especially if you're um, dealing with it, is characterized by relatively isolated speech and language problems, especially early on in the, um, in the journey. And uh, current consensus criteria identify three language variants or three types and one motor speech type. Uh, motor speech being how we control our um, muscles for speaking to produce fluent and intelligible speech. So we know that there is a semantic variant which involves difficulty retrieving words and comprehending words. Uh, the logopenic variant, which again is difficulty retrieving words and also holding a sentence in memory, repetition. So a, a component of what we call working memory. The non-fluent variant, which is also trouble retrieving words and building complex grammatical sentences. And this variant commonly occurs 
with the motor speech variant, which is a problem in controlling the neuromuscular system for clear intelligible speech. We also know that in about 20% of individuals with progressive aphasia that they don't fit neatly into one of these variants. And so we, um, they can sometimes be referred to as mixed. And that's particularly as um, they progress through the, um, the disease, the, um, they tend to start to develop symptoms of other conditions. So uh, words are the building blocks of our spoken communication. So it's not surprising that most of our treatments for progressive aphasia focus here in word finding, what we call word finding, just trying to find the word that you need um, as, you're as you're talking. So that is what we have found. Um, most of the treatment studies that are in the research literature uh, have been focused on word finding. And we've found that through uh, a recent um, extensive review of all the work on treatment in primary progressive aphasia. And this review is currently underway but preliminary findings were reported earlier this year at a conference in the United States. And the work was commissioned by the Academy uh, of Neurologic Communication Sci Disorders and Sciences, which is an organization in America. Uh, and the, and the, the systematic review has involved uh, quite a large team of researchers that cross um, the USA, Australia, and Canada. So I'll provide you with some, some sort of key points from that review to give you an overview. So essentially uh, about 100 research studies were identified when we went searching the literature, combing it uh, quite um, fastidiously. And about half or 45 of those have findings that we can use to inform our clinical treatments. So what we're actually doing with the patients. And uh, to the graph here shows the number of people with primary progressive aphasia that have been included in these studies each year. And you can see that the number is uh, growing quite quickly here, which means that this has gained much more attention just in the last five years. And quite good to see is that all the different colors here represent the different variants of aphasia. And what you can see here is that uh, you know, the different variants are being um, included in these studies with about equal proportion, which is good to see. And you can see here, this is an overview of the, um, of the, the percentage of studies that are focusing on different speech and language skills. And as I mentioned earlier, you can see that the vast majority of studies are testing ways to improve word finding. And these studies have emphasized picture naming rather than word finding in higher level storytelling or conversational activities. So storing and tell, storytelling and conversation are referred to as discourse. And we can see here, um, so there's our word finding, but we can see here that discourse uh, treatments uh, represent a very small number of all the studies that are available currently. And so it's very much an emerging area. By focus on word finding in picture naming tasks, we have um, essentially made, have essentially have three main expectations. And basically, these are that practice in producing a set of words will improve your ability to retrieve those words later, to retrieve similar words that you haven't practiced, and to build sentences during conversation. And so far, the results have seemed quite positive, but there are some important problems and gaps in that approach. So to give you a little bit of uh, uh, insight into what has been found, um, importantly, we see here uh, that all of the high quality studies, I mentioned there were about 45 that were good enough quality to really inform our clinical treatments. Uh, so about, um, so of those 45, uh, all of them seem to show um, improvement in the skills that were practiced during the treatment. So that's, that's uh, very positive. Essentially here, the blue color represents a positive outcome and the orange is a negative outcome, meaning no, uh, not, not a, uh, a response to the treatment. So all of the studies are showing a, a 
positive outcome for the, the, the skills that have been practiced. And this improvement seems to last for most people with about 80% of studies showing positive maintenance of those skills up to about a year later in some cases. And there has been some transfer, what we call generalization, um, of these improved skills beyond the specific items that were practiced. Again, about 80% of studies reporting positive effects. But what we see over here is that only about 40% of studies have tested whether the treatment changed communication in real life activities that are used outside the clinic. But it's reassuring to see that most outcomes were positive. As you recall, the vast majority of treatments focused on uh, word finding, specifically practicing of naming but it's becoming clear that individuals with progressive aphasia struggle not just with word finding, but with general organization of their discourse, telling stories or describing events that um, in a way that's easy for the listener to follow, or providing cohesive contributions in a conversation that can keep the conversation moving forward. And as you can see here, I mentioned already, that studies working on discourse skills are only emerging. That's just 4% of studies. So discourse, we also call it narrative, is essentially how we use language to communicate with others. So it's retelling stories. So for example, I'll give you some examples. So uh, retelling a story of how you met your partner, um, teaching a class, teaching your child the steps to make your favorite recipe or to change the tire on the car, uh, expressing your opinion about the best restaurants in the neighbourhood or the idea of vaccination passports to go on that long-awaited holiday. Uh, so working at the level of narrative, we can tackle a breadth of skills in meaningful real-life contexts. All of those skills on our pathway there, word finding, comprehension, building sentences, using our working memory to make sure that our sentences across the story are cohesive and follow a, a a logical flow and remembering what has been said in a conversation so that our, our contributions um, keep that conversation moving forward. And of course, the, the motor control side of things, which is being able to say um, our stories in a clear and intelligible way with, with um, fluency. So a discourse can tackle all of these things. I'll draw your attention to two emerging therapeutic methods with promising results in trials that are starting to be used in clinics. The first is VISTA. So VISTA is Video Implemented Script Training for Aphasia. And it was developed for people who experienced aphasia after a stroke, and, uh, but has been tested more recently in about 10 individuals with non-fluent, the non-fluent primary progressive aphasia variant. And this was a research study published by um, Henry and colleagues from uh, California in 2018. And so the, uh, the focus on the non-fluent primary progressive aphasia group meant that it was working on building grammatical sentences and into uh, discourse or, or um, short narratives. And importantly, on high intensity repeated practice of those um, stories, what are called scripts, uh, to work on the neuromuscular control of speech, fluency and intelligibility. And what they found was, um, Oh, sorry, what they actually do in that treatment is repeated rehearsal. So it's very high intensity uh, practice. Um, repeated rehearsal of these individualized scripts with the clinician once a week in the clinic and at home speaking along with a video, uh, which is what we call speech entrainment. So we know that speech entrainment facilitates production in individuals with non-fluent progressive aphasia. And what it involves is watching a video and here's an example from um, the Tactus website here where they've actually created an app that does a very simplistic uh, version of this. Um, but you watch a video of someone's mouth as they are speaking the script that you've, um, that you've developed. And uh, so you're watching them, you're listening to them. And then what you do is you speak alongside them. 
We actually heard the term shattering just before, and in speech pathology, we use the term shattering as well. Uh, it has a similar meaning, which just means that you speak um, at the same time as someone else. So you're using the, um, the, the video model to um, support your own um, fluency and rhythm of speaking. So you're speaking alongside the video. Uh, this example here from Tactus, as I said, is much more simplistic. It it's, has built-in phrases and you go through and there are over a hundred, oh, it says hundreds of sentences. So the common phrases like turn off the light, what did you say? Um, can you write that down? And so you have you go through and select which phrases you want to practice and they already have these recorded videos in here. But it's very easy uh, for a clinician to generate these videos for you, uh, for your own scripts, and send you home to practice those um, uh, as often as possible. So with that repeated practice, what they have found is that uh, individuals with non-fluent primary progressive aphasia have quite good results. They show reduced grammatical errors in their um, spoken production. Uh, not just for the scripts they've practiced, but for speaking in general and uh, or for, for generating new scripts, sorry, uh, and improved intelligibility and fluency. And those results have lasted up to one year for the scripts that they have practiced. Uh, so those scripts, those scripts are typically um, uh, more than one sentence, but they're usually uh, stories or um, uh, conversational topics that a person might engage in quite frequently. The second approach was developed by researchers in Perth in Western Australia and is currently being studied with a grant from the Dementia Australia Research Fund. So this approach is called NARNIA and it uh, stands for a novel approach to real life communication, narrative intervention in aphasia. And uh, it was developed by um, Associate Professor Anne Whitworth and uh, for people with stroke, again. Um, so most of, uh, or all of the treatments I think that we use in primary progressive aphasia have come from the stroke uh, literature where the research has been ongoing for many, many years. Uh, so with Jade Cartwright, um, Professor Whitworth has modified this to uh, be more specific to people with primary progressive aphasia and dementia generally. And so what Narnia does, it involves explicit teaching and practice on the structure of sentences. So here's a template that you work with between the clinician and the um, person with aphasia. So uh, you have developing the structure of sentences and then putting those sentences together into a story structure with beginning, a middle and an end. And uh, it also works at the word level with practice finding very specific nouns and verbs that you need to generate these sentences. And you have this template uh, which varies depending on the type of narrative you're telling, whether you're retelling an event, recalling an event, or um, describing the changing of the tire, or uh, giving an opinion, different, um, different genres of narrative. And in dementia, the, um, the approach has been modified largely by encouraging use of reminiscence to elicit and expand on recollections of past personal experiences, what's been called nostalgic recounts, uh, and using multi-sensory prompts. So using pi both pictures, sounds, artifacts to help stimulate uh, generating the story and memory uh, to support word finding, building sentences and the story structure. And the added benefit of this approach, which we, we have been using this approach with our um, families here in Sydney. And one thing that uh, I think both us and the uh, individuals that we've worked with have really enjoyed with this approach is that these co-constructed narratives can be collated into a book which can be shared or used for reminiscing. And so we've developed a number of these books for individuals that have sort of funny, interesting life stories of people that they can share with friends and family and uh, help in the future with uh, memory and reminiscence. So I'd like to draw your attention to the PPA Communication Project. And this, as I said, this was mentioned by Professor Piguet earlier today. And this is in response really to um, 
to requests that we had had from people with progressive aphasia coming through the Frontier Clinic, um, wanting, uh, you know, asking if there were avenues for uh, engaging in more systematic treatment for the speech and language difficulties. And uh, there are obviously services out in the community, um, but not um, very extensive. And we thought we were in a good position to be working with individuals with aphasia, uh, given um, you know we our level of knowledge. So we developed this uh, speech pathology clinic. And so at the University of Sydney, um, we have um, opened this clinic in collaboration with the existing communication disorders treatment and research clinic um, at the University of Sydney, which is a student-led clinic. And uh, it's run under the umbrella of that university clinic where we train our speech pathology students to learn how to assess and treat individuals with the whole range of, of speech and language um, difficulties or disorders, as well as swallowing disorders. Um, which is under the scope of practice of speech pathologists. And so uh, our clinic uh, is, is within that structure and it is um, uh, under the Faculty of Medicine and Health and funded through philanthropic donations to Frontier. And uh, we have essentially what happens there is our advanced speech pathology students see each client under the supervision of two qualified speech pathologists, myself and Penelope Munro. And the clinic currently runs one day a week, but we're expanding. Uh, we offer assessments and then work with families to design tailored programs working on communication abilities. And sometimes that's working on the communication skills we've mentioned so far, word finding and discourse. Sometimes it involves sourcing technology solutions to support communication and practice, or working with family members directly on how to better support the person with aphasia to communicate more effectively and inclusively. And so these images show our beautiful new Susan Wakefield Health Building on the Sydney campus at Camperdown, where our clinic is physically located up on the fifth floor. Uh, obviously, um, we offer services face to face in this clinic, but uh, we also have uh, pivoted quite rapidly to using telehealth, uh, using the Zoom platform that we're currently using. Uh, so we have been um, fully operational through all of the COVID period. Uh, so still seeing our clients over Zoom. And uh, here are our contact details if you would like to get in touch and ask us any questions or um, explore uh, what we can offer uh, in terms of our treatment service. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kiri, that was excellent. Um, whilst, whilst we wait for some, some questions to come through, I actually wanted to ask you one that we commonly uh, get asked in the clinic from, from carers, and that's around supporting patients with uh, who experience word finding difficulties um, when they if the patient is uh, speaking and they they can't find the word do you recommend the carer to actually fill in the word for them or give them time to say it? what's the best approach uh, in that scenario when they're talking yeah, I think, um, well, I think one approach first is to ask the, um, the individual with aphasia how they would like to be supported, because sometimes we think we step in and we supply the words and we think we're being helpful, but it can be irritating <laughs> um, and, and, um, and annoying and often we don't supply the right word. And so I think that's a negotiation about what is the best strategy. Um, so, but I think a lot of individuals do need um, that that um, support and so and, and the support may differ depending on the conversational context you're in so it's you know if it's one-on-one -on -one between um, the person with aphasia and their spouse it could be supplying the word is fine because you really just want to get the message across and carry the conversation on but if you're in a group of people that might be embarrassing and so it might be um you know providing some you know providing some context adding in a, a bit of um additional uh, information as you would in a conversation, but then handing it back to the person with aphasia so it looks like they're still engaged. 
uh, we what we use in therapy a lot is cueing. So, you know, um, are you talking about, you know, and, and giving some questions, some asking clarification questions, or, you know, d can you tell me something about the word? Does it start with X, whatever? Um, so there are sort of cueing methods, um, sort of trying to keep the conversation going, but then handing back to the person with sort of conversational methods. Uh, but then in some cases, actually supplying the word. So, and supplying the word, I think, becomes more common as people experience more and more difficulty as time goes on um, and, and allows the conversation to keep going. Yeah, but, but ultimately um, in, in the therapeutic context, we try not to supply the word. We try to help the person develop strategies to help them cue themselves um, and just also go um, engage in a lot of intensive practice at um, producing and repeating these words. Because I think one thing the research has shown us largely is that you get better at words if you practice them a lot. <laughs> It's the old use it or lose it kind of uh, philosophy. Um, so we're, we're trying to help them sort of retrieve the words themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, we've got another question here from Trish. Uh, she says, can you speak a little bit about the support you give for swallowing problems? Uh, and at what point do you start intervening the swallowing difficulty? Yeah. Yeah, so swallowing difficulties are going to be more common in certain types uh, of FTD than others, and we know which types, so we're very aware and we watch for that. And it's something that you want to sort of um, be mindful of um, for certain variants of FTD before swallowing symptoms arise because uh, they're obviously... Um, they carry serious health risks if they're not identified early and managed. And so uh, we do have a swallowing clinic similar to our PPA communication clinic um, at, this, at the university clinic here. Um, it's not quite as organised as our clinic, um, but it is there and available. Uh, but there are certainly... Um, you know, most speech pathologies in the community, particularly outpatient community um, clinics at hospitals, but also private clinics that will do swallowing assessments. And typically, um, you know, what we're asking, we have a couple of questionnaires that are easy to fill out that sort of start to identify if there are some key indicators. And usually it's around um, not being able to manage certain types of food anymore. So, you know, meat that needs a lot of chewing or hard um, carrots and things like that, or noticing that someone is coughing a little bit during their eating or coughing when they drink um, or not being able to sort of, you know, we can eat and talk at the same time. You know, it's not advised, but most of us can manage it. But, you know, are they having difficulty doing that? And so all of those are sort of signs that um, they may be at risk for food or liquid going down into the airways and that then puts them at risk for uh, pneumonias. And so you want to catch those things very early. Uh, better to to get an assessment early than wait. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and speaking of assessment, Kiri, um, a few people are asking about uh, if they can access your speech pathology clinics from interstate, seeing, seeing as though it's on Zoom. Um, is there scope for that for people to access the clinic, your clinic um, from, from interstate? From state? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we have, in fact, I think about half of the clients that we're seeing currently are um, from a different state. So um, that's that's quite reasonable. Yeah, yeah. You know, at the moment we um, we are managing. We're hoping to expand, and we have some facility to expand. And obviously, um, you know, as more people come on board, hopefully we can manage that. So. Uh, it is, you know, um, as I said, you know, we do want to be upfront that it is um, advanced speech pathology students that are delivering the treatments. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them are excellent. Occasionally you get the, uh, the bum student. <laughs> but we, um, we supervise everything very, very closely. And so, um, you know, we step in and, and um, help out if the student is struggling. But we see it as a, 
a wonderful opportunity for students to really build their skills in this area so that the next generation of clinicians coming out uh, are really much better equipped to help people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and we can put some more information about your, your clinic on the, on the website as well so people can access it there. Um, also a question about, um, Simona ask a question, uh, is asking a question about the swallowing clinic that you had mentioned before. So is that available for um, patients to uh, visit? And also, um, how do they go about contacting them? And a third question is, is it, do you know if that's covered by the NDIS? Right, right. So um, we don't, uh, I, I don't think it's covered by the NDIS, but being a university clinic, uh, we, um, oh, first of all, you, uh, if you can read that, um, the contact number there, the, the email address, which is speech.clinic at sydney.edu.au and the phone number there, uh, those are for the, the, the umbrella clinic. And so that's all the contact goes through there and they will divert you either to us or to the swallowing clinic or uh, to our general um, waiting list. Uh, so the question was, how do you get in touch? You go through them. What was the other question? Uh, is, oh. is, is, yeah, Sorry. is it available and how do you contact, which is... Um... Oh, it was, um, is it covered by the NDIS? Um, yes. So being a university clinic, uh, it is um, very, very low cost. And so um, I don't think you can, uh, as far as I'm aware, you, I'm not sure actually, I should know the answer to that. I was under the impression that, you, so if you have a package um, you can, that you can use the money how you see fit, you can use that money to pay us. Um, from your NDIS funds. But if you have a program where you have to have got approval um, up front for a particular service, no. Um, so some people can use their NDIS funds um, to pay us, but it is a university clinic. So it is very, very low cost. And so for example, at the moment, it won't necessarily stay this way, but at the moment um, for people who are over 65, the services are free. And for people under 65, they're only, um, for, for our clinic, and uh, it's under $10, it's $10 a session. So it's, it's very financially affordable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, actually, we have a little bit of feedback here from um, Kirsty, who says, we have found that all the advanced students have been extremely professional, empathetic, generally excellent students we have loved them all so no thank you very much. <laughs> um i think that's that's it for the questions um for your talk kiri thank you so much if there's any other questions we'll you know we'll get in contact with kiri and um put up some information on our website about her clinic um thank you so much kiri for that so um moving on from kiri's talk and, and sort of related to kiri's talk um we're going to head into the break now but uh, I wanted to actually uh, screen a, um, a video of a lovely couple who, who come to our clinic um, who has, well, the wife has um, primary progressive aphasia. And many of you might have already seen this video uh, because we've posted it on our social media and we've distributed it. But I I'd like to screen it here today um, just to further kind of bring awareness and further show uh, the story, the personal stories of people who are affected with FTD. So I'll put that on in a moment and then we'll head into the break. Um, grab a bite to eat, tea or coffee, um, and then we'll come back uh, in a little under an hour, so at 12.45, and then we'll start uh, to hear some more practical talks about music therapy and FTD, um, financial skills, uh, the Q&A panel, and we'll also hear from uh, one of our carers as well. So, and of course, during the break, if you think of questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll put these together for the panel. Thanks. All right, so. Chilling with the future. 
much. Yeah, you know, I sometimes listen to your voice message on the phone, so I remember what your voice was like and remember how it was. Jill has a uh, class of FTD, frontotemporal dementia, which is presently um, manifest in primary progressive aphasia, which is uh, the onset of the dementia has affected her ability to speak, uh, to speak so that she now can't speak at all. Uh, she has difficulty uh, reading, and well, she can't read and she can't write. More recently, uh, with our reviews, annual reviews at Frontier, uh, it's been discovered that Jill has now uh, some signs of apraxia and has lost some uh, motor control in her hands and her ability to, uh, to do simple, ordinary tasks. Jill no longer has the ability to socialise, uh, to chat with her friends, to um, meet up for coffee, to go for lunch, to uh, talk to her grandchildren, to talk uh, to her children, uh, just everyday conversations, everyday things that we all take for granted are gone. And the loss and the frustration that, uh, that this brings is just immeasurable. It seems to me that uh, the medical community ought to be um, educated and aware of this type of uh, dementia and uh, how to recognise it, how to recognise the signs of it. Because we were sent down so many uh, dead ends, um, which um, was difficult, which was a frustrating, time-consuming, costly, um, non-productive exercise. So it was a journey of discovery for us then to work out what it was and what the implications were. Um, part of that is um, brought on by ourselves because we're both in denial. We're both afraid to see what the future looks like. We're both afraid to see what the disease is going to do. Because I love her so much, um, the frustration and the impossibility of doing something for her to, to reverse it, to stop it, to cure it, to watch the slow progress of this really cruel disease is just beyond words. I see we're with each other every day and I see uh, the subtle changes that have developed over time and the not so subtle ones and the difficulty that Jill has, uh, the, the emotional toll that it's taking on her, the uh, frustration that she feels um, not being able to communicate with me. The easiest way for us to communicate is for me to ask uh, yes or no questions, closed answer questions so she can indicate to me thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, because of her illness, sometimes she gets uh, confused about that and I have to wait for her. If I, she gives me a thumbs up and I know it's wrong, she'll eventually get it right. But uh, when she wants to tell me that she loves me, she puts a hand on her heart and then puts a hand on mine and she does that to the kids. And um, the thing that gives her the most joy in life is, I think, being with her family, being with her kids. Um, they have a special bond with their mum, as I suppose most all kids do. But uh, being with her kids and with her grandkids um, and family occasions, she just loves that. Um, because we've had uh, so much adversity uh, through this illness, um, my job is to try and bring a little joy into our lives, a little happiness into our lives, because we just can't, cannot live the rest of our lives out, whatever time's left to us, in uh, despair or hopelessness. So I try to make a laugh and every chance I get. And just to let her know that life hasn't stopped, that uh, 
we can still enjoy special moments together and that uh, we've still we're still not as bad off as some all her life she's uh, been a woman who never complained never complained about difficulty never complained about adversity and we've been through some um, and in this the biggest challenge of our lives she's the same she's courageous and won't complain and I know it's been so hard for her but uh, she's tough as she's gentle thoughtful um, and has so much love to give her family her kids and the grandkids and uh, I've been so lucky to have her all my life because uh, my life has been not without its difficulty but to have her here she's rock solid always has been and she's the most beautiful girl you could ever wish for it's gonna be okay it's okay, okay, it's okay. Be okay be right. you're still here gonna still be gotcha. okay be okay be all right it's gonna be okay be okay be okay be all right in time gonna be okay be okay Hi, you've reached the phone of Jill Ferguson. Can't take your call at the moment. If you leave a message, call your number, I'll get back to you.
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a, a nice break. We'll head into the afternoon sessions now. So uh, to begin, we've got Dr. Stephanie Wong on the screen here. So um, Stephanie actually uh, works at our clinic as well. Um, she is um, she's a research fellow and she's also a clinical neuropsychologist at our clinic and also at Flinders University in Adelaide. Um, her research combines neuropsychology, cognitive neuroscience, neuroimaging uh, to investigate areas like emotion, reward processing, social cognition and financial capacity in people with FTD. So a nice broad range of areas. Um, today, she's going to tell us a bit more about her most recent research, which is on financial capacity in people with FTD. Um, and this is a quite a new area of research, so it'll be good to hear from, from Stephanie about this. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Oh, thanks, Meryl. Um, I'll just share my screen. Let me know if there's any problems. Everyone see that? Is that fine? Yep. Yeah? Okay. Well, no. Good. Okay, I'll assume it's all good then. Great. Well, yeah, thanks, Meryl, for um, that lovely introduction. Um, and yeah, it's great to see everyone um, on Zoom, I guess. Um, I Up till about July, I was based in Sydney working at Frontier. But um, yeah, recently, I've just moved over to Adelaide, where I'm now based at um, Flinders University. Um, but yeah, I still have a lot of ongoing projects with Frontier, um, particularly this one on um, financial skills in FTD. So I thought I'd um, talk a bit about um, financial skills, financial capability in FTD today. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, hopefully I can um, give some practical tips on, uh, you know, planning ahead and uh, looking after your finances. So I'll just click through the next slide. Okay, so all right, so to get off, get started, a um, bit of background. We know that, you know, being able to manage your own finances um, and make financial decisions um, is really important for, um, you know, living independently. Um, and unfortunately, having dementia puts many people at um, greater risk of, you know, money problems for um, quite a few different reasons. Um, in particular, you know, different symptoms of dementia can really affect a person's ability to uh, manage their finances, um, and people might be um, less able to judge risk, which also might make them a bit more vulnerable to things like financial exploitation. Now, in fact, um, a very recent study in the US looked at um, kind of like the financial records of a huge number of people, over 80,000 people. Um, and they looked at these people's financial records and they found that um, actually money problems can be one of the earliest signs of dementia. So these were up to about, so they looked at the financial records and they also compared these to people's Medicare records um, to look at kind of um, diagnosis of dementia. And what they found was, you know, up to six years before people were being diagnosed with dementia, um, people were more likely to have of, um, missed payments on credit cards or loan accounts, um, and also subprime credit ratings, which um, is a bit different in the US compared to here. But um, yeah, it's just important to, um, it's very striking that, you know, these sorts of things were picked up um, in people's financial records up to six years before um, they were diagnosed. Um, and these sorts of problems um, continue to you know, persist for at least three and a half years after diagnosis. So what this means is like even after um, they're diagnosed with dementia, um, it can take some time for people to kind of um, uh, address these problems and kind of get everything in order. So it's a huge problem. Um, and I mean, this, um, there was also a survey done um, by the Alzheimer's Society in, UK, in the UK, um, where they interviewed people with dementia as well as their carers, um, and just asked them about, you know, what sort of issues they might have when managing money. And um, hearing from people with dementia, um, in the survey, actually 76% of people said that they, you know, had difficulties managing their money. And um, they were reporting things like, you know, feeling uncomfortable or um, kind of awkward talking about financial issues, particularly kind of um, in family settings. Um, they reported feeling really pressurized when, for example, shopping in a unfamiliar um, setting um, and where like, you know, the staff might not necessarily know that, you know, they have dementia and they need extra help. Um, and they also reported that they found it really difficult with all these extra new banking security measures um, 
especially you know these days with like double uh, was it two factor authentication and all that sort of stuff they found it really really complicated and then on the carer side of things, you know, more than a third of carers um, experience difficulties managing the money of, you know, their, um, their loved one. Um, and they reported lots of, um, I guess, emotional and psychological barriers to taking over, you know, the finances. Um, and then they found it also difficult to cope with, you know, suddenly being that primary person who had to take charge of money. Um, so uh, we know that um, in a lot of relationships, you know, one person tends to, um, you know, take uh, be the person in charge of, you know, looking after finances. Um, it might be a little bit different in um, younger populations now, but um, um, particularly people in the older age group, they found it really um, hard to cope with this. Uh, carers also reported having uh, not that much information available and support about, you know, um, how to manage these difficulties. Um, and they also reported lots of difficulties with dealing with banks and other service providers, um, especially when, you know, trying to prove that, you know, um, they were um, the, the person who's supposed to be supporting um, the person with dementia and getting access to accounts and all those, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, what I really wanted to highlight today here is, well, because, you know, um, it's a forum on frontotemporal dementia, um, is, you know, financial problems actually in people with younger onset dementia, like FTD, presents a really um, unique set of challenges because, um, you know, people with FTD tend to be much younger than you know, other people with dementia. So it's a very unique set of challenges. So they're more likely to be juggling things like paying off mortgages, supporting their children's educational fees, um, and they might have had to, you know, scale back on employment or maybe they um, were laid off or, you know, um, couldn't access employment anymore. Um, and, you know, they also have difficulties accessing things like age pensions because they're not kind of at that age um, threshold yet. Um, and on top of this, um, spouses often have to balance um, employment with caring roles, which, you know, sometimes means early retirement for the spouse as well. Um, and actually, until very recently, the majority of research looking into these sorts of financial difficulties in dementia tended to mostly focus on people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but we know, you know, that the types of financial problems experienced by people with Alzheimer's disease can be quite different to um, the problems experienced by people with um, FTD. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but before I move into that, um, I mean, when we think about financial problems, um, they can be classified in different ways. And so here are some examples of what kind of family members and carers have reported. So things like, oh, she's been finding it difficult handling the maths side of money. Um, it's kind of given up control of um, things like um, paying bills, decisions and superannuation, things like that all the way through to things like, oh, he signed up for um, some financial schemes that he doesn't use, or even things like, oh, he's actually given away more than $600,000 to um, what seems like a scam, um, but doesn't seem to um, uh, recognize that, um, you know, this is problematic. So when we have a look at all of these, we can kind of broadly classify these types of financial difficulties as errors versus exploitation. So errors are, you know, uh, things like mismanagement of money, things like forgetting to pay bills, miscalculating payments, uh, difficulties budgeting. Um, and this really contrasts to financial exploitation, which really refers to a, a abuse of trust in order to gain access to another person's money or property. So for example, um, victims of financial exploitation might be pressured to loan or give away their money, sell their property, sign up for bogus investments, um, or even donate to fake charities. So, I mean, what actually contributes to these sorts of um, financial behaviors? Well, I mean, in our research, we've kind of thought about, you know, different um, things uh, that can give rise to these errors and exploitation, and they can broadly be classified into cognitive factors and emotion, uh, socio-emotional factors. So, you know, cognitive factors include things like um, difficulties with attention, memory, language, 
as well as difficulties with executive functions like um, flexibility, um, impulse control, um, and planning and organization. So these are really important kind of um, cognitive skills for things like, you know, being able to budget, um, calculate prices, uh, keep track of bills. Um, and it's really important for things like um, planning and prioritizing certain uh, choices over others. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have these kind of more socio-emotional factors that contribute to um, financial um, errors and exploitation. So for example, um, understanding other people's emotions and intentions or understanding social interactions. Uh, so if you have difficulties in these areas, that might increase your risk for financial exploitation. Um, and finally, things like um, emotional responsiveness or sensitivity to gains and losses. Um, this might contribute to um, difficulties with uh, financial decision making. Um, and it's been linked to things like, you know, overspending and um, risk taking like um, in gambling. Okay. So, you know, when we think about the different symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and behavioral variant FTD, we might expect to see some differences um, in the types of um, financial problems they experience. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I'll just give a very quick overview. So in, you know, Alzheimer's disease, memory loss is the, um, the main um, symptom. Um, and people can also have um, some executive dysfunction. So difficulties with flexibility, planning, judgment, and reasoning. Whereas in behavioral variant FTD, um, you know, the pr predominant changes are more behavior related. So um, socially inappropriate behavior, difficulties uh, with perspective taking and understanding other people, um, and also impulsivity. But executive dysfunction can also um, be common in um, these patients as well. So similar to Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, similar difficulties with flexibility and planning and those sorts of things. And so in um, one of our studies, we looked at um, you know, the profiles of financial errors and exploitation in these two patient groups. And we used uh, just some care and informant um, measures. So things like uh, the disability assessment for dementia. So, I mean, those of you who have participated in our research at Frontier might remember filling out some of these questions. Um, so yeah, these questions here are more related to um, financial errors. And then we asked some more specific questions about gullibility and um, financial exploitation. So, you know, asking, you know, how often have they been tricked into, um, you know, buying things they don't need uh, or talked into, you know, giving away personal account details. So on these two questionnaire measures, we had a look at comparing Alzheimer's disease with behavioral variant FTD. And we see that um, in terms of financial errors, um, both, of, both of these patient groups show um, quite a high number of these um, financial errors. Um, and uh, this wasn't actually different between the two groups. So they were equally common between these two patient groups. Uh, but when we have a look at financial exploitation, we see that the behavioral variant FTD patients are significantly more susceptible to um, uh, you know, financial scams and being um, uh, persuaded to give away personal details and things like that. So they were highly vulnerable to financial exploitation. But you know, why do these profiles differ? Uh, well, we had a look in this study at you know, what areas of cognition and socio-emotional functioning might um, uh, be related to these um, financial errors and exploitation. So in Alzheimer's disease, financial errors were very common. And this seemed to be related to changes in attention and cognitive flexibility. And in this patient group, they seem to be less susceptible to financial exploitation as a group, but those who were more susceptible tended to be those who were kind of more severe um, or kind of further along in the disease stage and they had more memory loss. So um, I guess as, as they progress in the disease, they become more susceptible to financial exploitation. On the other hand, in behavioral variant FTD, we see that financial errors are also very common, but this seems to be related to changes in um, kind of impulse or inhibitory control. And particularly in this group, what we found was that they were very, very susceptible to financial exploitation. And this seemed to be um, related to changes in um, you know, their ability to recognize emotions. 
So it could be that, you know, in um, our FTD patients, um, they're less able to kind of understand other people's facial emotions and subtle social cues. Um, and because they're having difficulty in this area, they might be more gullible and more susceptible to scams and exploitation. So it's really important to understand how these different profiles of um, financial errors and exploitation differ um, and how they relate to different underlying kind of cognitive and um, emotional changes. And this really helps um, inform, you know, how we can um, target these um, difficulties to manage these different financial problems. So, for example, you know, supporting attention and flexibility in Alzheimer's disease might be really helpful in, um, in these patient group, but not so helpful in behavioral variant FTD, where it might be more important to kind of support um, their changes in um, kind of emotion recognition and social cognition. All right, so that's just a little bit about um, some of the research we've done so far, but actually I'm going to talk a bit more about, you know, how we can identify financial problems and what we're doing in our research to improve this process. So at the moment, you know, the onus is very much still on um, carers and family members to pick up on any kind of potential um, financial problems. Um, but, you know, the signs or the red flags might not be recognised for some time um, and it might not always be noticed or reported. Um, you know, some people might not feel comfortable talking about their finances to a doctor. They might not feel like it's a medical issue. Or on the other side, you know, clinicians might not necessarily ask about it. Um, and although, you know, there are very good questionnaires that we use um, in research, like the ones I talked about, um, this tends to only be used in research settings and not so much in like a typical clinic. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different aspects of um, financial capability, um, like before I talked about errors and exploitation. Um, and so it can be quite uh, difficult to, you know, objectively say whether a person with dementia can or can't do certain things. So um, sometimes this can be kind of either overestimated or underestimated um, and how we report these sorts of things, you know, of course varies from person to person. So, you know, often based on these sorts of reports, um, clinicians can only make very kind of um, general recommendations for what to do. Um, and generally it tends to be that the recommendation is just take away that person's access to money and basically limit their financial independence. So, you know, because there is such a huge variability in, you know, how and what financial problems are reported, we've been working on developing a financial skills test. So, you know, just like the way in the clinic we do memory tests to test, you know, how people learn and remember things, we are developing a, a financial skills test to look at um, how people perform on everyday financial tasks. So things like handling cash, paying bills, um, budgeting, um, and uh, what are we doing? Also um, uh, spotting scams and also financial decision making. So we're developing a test to look at all these different aspects um, and how these change with different types of dementia. Um, and so the aim is to get a comprehensive understanding um, of you know, which particular areas um, people might be struggling with. And then we, by understanding what they're having more trouble with, we can work to develop uh, more targeted interventions that work to really support financial independence. So for example, instead of completely taking away someone's access to their money, their test results might show that actually, you know, they're fine with their everyday purchases, like gross groceries, but they need more support with the big financial decisions like, um, uh, selling property or you know longer term budgeting. So what we're really helping hoping to do is to provide recommendations that really maximize a person's autonomy and provide support in areas when needed. So that is really exciting and under development at the moment. Um, but what we're also doing um, is also working to make this test more freely available. So we're actually, we're developing a short quiz version of the test, which will be available on a website, hopefully uh, by early next year. Um, and so instead of needing to see a clinician to do the test, this is completely self-completed online. Uh, it's not as detailed, but it does provide a quick and free screening test of financial capability. And after doing the short quiz, you get a, uh, 
you know, targeted feedback about your results and also recommendations uh, for where to get help if needed. So, you know, this sort of online test is more targeted at people who may not necessarily be diagnosed with dementia yet, but they or their family members might be a bit concerned about, you know, potential problems. Um, and we know that, you know, this is particularly important because um, uh, having difficulties with finances can be a very early sign of dementia. So um, hopefully we'll um, keep updates posted on um, social media as well as the website, but hopefully that will be available early next year. All right, so in this last section, hopefully I have a bit of time. Um, I just wanted to quickly talk about some more practical tips. So firstly, you know, it's a really important to identify the red flags. So things like uh, trouble handling cash, um, calculations, um, any unpaid and unopened bills, um, lots of new purchases that are kind of um, strange or out of character, um, money missing from bank accounts um, that you don't really understand or don't know where it's from. Um, and also if the person seems to be a bit worried when talking about money or a bit concerned or nervous. Um, and also really important to look out for red flags of uh, financial exploitation. So things like uh, really suspicious transactions on bank accounts, again, that you can't really explain or can't trace. Um, signatures that don't look like that person's signature, um, changes to their will, um, which don't seem um, right, um, and also just um, signing legal documents um, without knowing what those actual documents mean. So um, there's also oh, valuable items missing from the home that kind of aren't really explained as well. So in terms of resources, I can point you to um, scamwatch.gov.au. They've got some really fantastic resources on um, and videos and um, things on, you know, how to protect yourself from scams, what to look out for, um, and some really kind of good step-by-step -step guides. And also the moneysmart.gov.au website as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, how to manage these changes, um, you know, if you're observing these changes, how do you know if, you know, if it's time to get help? I mean, firstly, it's, it's really important to have an honest conversation with the person you're caring for. So um, expressing your concerns, giving specific examples of things you've noticed. Um, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's a really hard conversation um, and lots of people often feel suspicious if you're trying to take over their financial affairs. So, you know, it's, it's often um, a balancing act between, you know, providing the support and helping them um, maintain their sense of independence. But, you know, after you've had this chat, I mean, there are some things that you can set up. So things like um, simplifying bank accounts and credit cards, so, you know, not having a bazillion different accounts, just you know, simplifying it so it's easy to keep track. Um, setting up safety systems um, for accessing cash. So you can you know, do things like minimize spending limits on credit or debit cards, um, or instead of using um, cards, you can um, give the person cash for them to use um, per week um, and you know, dedicate that as you know, their money. You can set up um, reminder systems for bills and payments. Um, so, you know, to help support them, you might just put all of them together um, and um, work through them together. Put them, um, you know, in one document so they're easy to track. Um, and also just monitor the, you know, um, any unexpected or suspicious activity. So, um, I mean, it is a bit more difficult as, you know, financial records are shifting all online, but actually a lot of banks these days have um, set up re um, really good um, systems for um, checking and also to set up, um, you know, access for um, carers or family members as well. Okay, um, and just a final note, we know that uh, most people put off uh, making wills for as long as they can. Um, you know, they also put off appointing things like power of attorney um, and organizing end of life issues. But um, it is really important to start planning. So um, it can be confronting, um, but it's, it's just really important. So, I mean, there's a lot of useful resources out there, and I'll point to some um, in the next slide. Um, things like, you know, uh, appointing the um, enduring power of attorney. So, you know, this lets you choose someone to make financial and legal decisions for the person with dementia if they can't make them. So it's important to choose someone you trust and someone who will ask, um, act in their best interests. 
Um, but I will note that, you know, there are different rules across all the different states in Australia. Um, and again, I'll refer you to the um, Dementia Australia website, which sets out very clearly what you need to do and what sort of processes are there. Um, of course, it's important to update your wills. It's a good time to, you know, review and make sure it's up to date. If you don't have one, definitely make one. Um, Superannuation, people often forget about this, but to make sure your super goes to the right people, um, you need to actually make a binding nomination. Um, and you have to do this through your super fund, not through your will, um, because if you don't nominate anyone, the super fund trustee will decide where your money goes. So that's, that's not good. Um, and then the really important thing, just sort out your important documents just to make things easier. Um, so for you and any other kind of legal professionals involved. So you know, your personal documents, house documents, finance documents, health documents, um, all those sorts of things. Okay, so yeah, I mentioned some really useful resources. So actually the, um, the Dementia Australia website is fantastic. There is a section um, called planning ahead and there's a really useful instructional video and it breaks down everything you need and it has links to all the useful resources as well. Uh, and the moneysmart.gov.au website is also really helpful for um, kind of um, setting out um, kind of useful tips and guidelines. Okay, so not much time left, so I might just quickly summarize. So we know that financial problems are often an early sign of dementia. Um, and for FTE specifically, um, uh, people with behavioral variant, um, they are very susceptible to um, both financial errors as well as exploitation. And this seems to be um, quite different from other forms of younger onset dementia. Uh, we need to improve our assessment of financial skills. Um, and this is so that we can detect these difficulties earlier, as well as um, improve the way we care and manage for these difficulties with a focus on you know, supporting a person's financial autonomy rather than limiting their independence. Um, and by you know, improving the way we assess these things, then we can work to develop more targeted interventions. And finally, there are lots of different ways to manage um, financial capability um, and to minimize risk for financial exploitation. So all, not all of these will work for every single person, um, but yeah, it's, it's good to kind of um, have a look at these suggestions and work out you know, what's most relevant and what you think might be most helpful in your case. Okay, I'd like to just end by thanking everyone involved in my research, particularly uh, all the participants and the families who have, you know, answered all these questions or done financial skills tests over the past few years, uh, as well as the um, various uh, research clinics and funding bodies. Okay, happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Steph. That was excellent. So practical as well for people. Um, and I can see people in the chat are putting up their stories of, um, financial mishaps that have happened um, to people with FTE. Uh, there's just a question here, Steph, about um, what about if the person with FTE doesn't acknowledge that they are having difficulty? Uh, what can we do to minimise financial risk in that sort of a situation? Yeah, definitely. That is one of the most common ones. And it's really hard when the person um, doesn't have insight. So, I mean, this is where it's really important to um, have that honest chat with them. And even though they might not take that on board, um, set up those limits on their credit cards. Uh, I know it sounds really terrible, but that is the best way really to kind of mitigate the risk. Um, and also um, if um, they are, you know, having problems with online scams and things like that, setting up things like, you know, cybersecurity and limiting access to certain websites as well. Um, there's some really useful information on scamwatch.gov. Okay. Um, and also, so Gemma has written in, she said, um, I'm surprised that there's not a category for impulsive and risk-taking risk -taking spending not related to being exploited. I think mm. Gem's wondering what category that kind of behaviour fits into. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't talk too much about um, the specific areas of the test, um, but we do so that we, in our test, we've developed three different sections. One of them is more kind of everyday budgeting, handling cash, that sort of thing. Uh, the middle section is all about scams and um, gullibility. Um, and the final section is all about kind of decision making. Um, and that's where we assess things like, you know, impulsive purchases um, or, um, yeah, overspending and risky um, 
spending as well. Yeah. Good. And just one more, um, one more comment. So someone's written in and said, uh, my friend's husband sold their home quite cheaply, sadly in his name, while she was away overseas well before a diagnosis. So is this, some, is this an example of that early, you know, financial error that's happening in the very early stages? Yeah. Is this an example? Yeah, that's a, a, a sad, really sad example of, you know, how um, because we don't have very good awareness of these um, these sorts of changes. I mean, a lot of our work is really kind of trying to get the word out there that, you know, we really need to um, educate. I mean, not just um, people with dementia and their families, but also people in like the legal profession and mm -hmm. um, bank employees and things like that. Um, we're really starting to, you know, um, get the word out there. But um, if people had known more about these sorts of problems, um, then yeah, hopefully we can kind of mitigate these um, these risks and reduce exploitation that way as well. Yeah, and that's interesting that you say, you know, you're just starting to touch the surface with the legal profession and, you know, even with some doctors and everything, understanding this other practical side to the whole, to the illness. Yeah. Good. Well, we might leave it there. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was really interesting. And we'll repost some of the links that you had provided um, for people to access. So um, we'll move on now to our next speaker. So um, I'd like to invite um, Gina. So Gina is um, a music therapist. Um, so she is, um, she's a music therapist, like I said, and she has a strong passion for aged care and neuro rehabilitation. She is based in Sydney and she works in private practice as well as residential aged care homes and also within the community. Um, she's involved in research and she's uh, currently undertaking, uh, she currently is one of the next gen ambassadors of leading aged care services in Australia. So today she's going to provide us with an overview of how music therapy can be of benefit to people with FTD. Thank you, Gina. Thanks for the great uh, introduction. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Cool. All righty. Thank you for joining me for my talk on music engagement for people living with FTD today, everyone. Um, so today we'll look at a quick definition of what music therapy is, um, followed by some information on how to brain, how to brain and music actually interact, as well as the role of music in everyday life. And I'll be finishing up with some evidence-based activities that you can try at home. So music therapy is intentional use of music by university trained therapists that is registered with the Australian Music Therapy Association or the AMTA. It is an evidence based intervention that aims to improve quality of life and in that way it differs from music education and music entertainment. So it's become pretty standard knowledge these days that uh, music engagement, whether it be receptive or active, stimulates the whole brain as depicted by this moving image that I've stolen from um, the University of Central Florida's site. <laughs> um, and, you know, when we're listening to music, we're processing a whole lot more than we think. We're thinking at the rhythm, the pitch, the overall structure of the song, any emotions or memories that evokes. And if there's words in the music, then we're processing language as well. And additionally, when we are making music, um, we're also listening for cues, planning our motor responses and exercising self-regulation. And so in this way, music engagement, whether it be receptive or active, is an integration of auditory, sensory and motor processes. Uh, and because we're engaging multiple regions of the brain simultaneously, this builds connectivity and induces neuroplasticity, that is the brain's ability to modify its connections and rewire itself. And hence, music engagement can maintain or slow cognitive decline. Also on a note of how music activates the whole brain, this leaves reserves of musical imprint that people can draw on in the face of damage that's occurred to the brain. Now, as humans, we're very attuned to rhythm and pitch, and so music can alter our emotional and arousal states. 
when we're happy, we play happy music. But when we're sad, we might also play happy music to pick ourselves back up. And this works because music stimulates the reward centers and triggers the release of feel good hormones. Music can also affect the autonomic physiological responses as breathing and heart rate. And therefore, when we put on relaxing music, which tends to be slow, our breathing attunes to the slowness in the music and this lowers our heart rate and induces a state of relaxation. Um, and so that kind of also is entrainment and entrainment is where two or more systems lock into a unified time. Now, I've got this article here that's kind of speaking about rhythmic entrainment and the motor system, and this is more relevant to motor rehabilitation, but it also gives a plausible explanation as to why people are motivated and able to play instruments or sing even when functional movement or speech is compromised. The article suggests that the firing of neurons in the brain entrains with the rhythms in music and primes the brain for action. And this works because music creates predictable time scales that optimizes anticipation and cues the motor processes for speech and movement. And um, Dr. Michael Tout, who wrote this article, has coined the concept neural entrainment. And he has based a whole branch of music therapy practice named neurologic music therapy on it. And it's a very scientific branch of music therapy as well. So my last point um, about music and everyday life, in fact, is how music is associated with time, place, people and events. We use music to accompany activities such as exercise, um, birthday parties, you name it, weddings, etc. And so in this way, music can become symbolic rep representations of people and events. And in music therapy, especially in aged care and with dementia in general, we often use music from a person's reminiscent bump. And those are the formative years of a person's life, usually between the ages of 20 and 30, when all the really exciting things are happening that form our self-identity. Next, we'll go on to some activities as well as some outcomes to kind of give you some ideas on what to try at home and also know when to apply it and to deepen your understanding of music therapy, really. So we're going to look at music listening, singing, rhythm-based activities and songwriting today. Music listening is a very meaningful way to pass time, whether alone or together. We can use music as a, as a bouncing board for discussion about thoughts, feelings, and memories. We can also enrich environments of music for the performance of daily activities, like uh, eating, showering, and exercise, as we'll see later as well. This is especially useful if a person experiences difficulties with personal care, where music creates a familiar environment and decreases confusion and anxiety but also can act as a distraction. Um, I know that some people like to allocate specific music to specific activities so that the music can act as a cue to let people know what to anticipate. And because we spoke about the relationship between the rhythms of music in music and motor movement, um, it is great to uh, accompany exercise, whether that be for general well-being or physiotherapy. This is because music, as I mentioned earlier, triggers the release of feel-good hormones that then decreases the monotony of exercise and repetitive movement, as well as perceived pain. And further, because our movements entrain with the music, the music then acts as a motivator that carries movement. And it feels like we're hardly working. <laughs> okay, so some outcomes. As we saw earlier as well, uh, music listening activates the whole brain. So this is cognitive stimulation that leads to increased connectivity in the brain. When we're sharing music, musical experiences, it is a possible, pos positive shared experience that supports social bonding. Um, mus using music to facilitate daily activities can lead to better compliance with um, personal care and exercise. And um, paramount to this as well is improved psychological well-being. So music can enhance mood, can induce relaxation to decrease stress, anxiety and agitation, can facilitate reminiscence, which then leads on to a maintenance of self-identity 
And I guess music can be used for sleep and this improves sleep. Some tips if you plan on using music listening um, with your person is to use music that is familiar and meaningful to the person, to select music that matches the energy levels and um, of the person or activity. And um, one thing that I've realized in my work is that music that changes erratically causes agitation. So be careful of the radio or even a TV as a matter of fact. And final point is that music can provoke negative feelings and memories. So always monitor the emotional response of a person you're listening to music with. Um, and music that makes us feel good today might make us feel bad tomorrow. So it's hard to tell. And um, one point that's not in here as well is that a person's preferences may change over time. So if a person previously liked very um, dense and complicated music, they may not like that anymore and prefer things that are more simple and melodious. Playlist for Life is a non-for-profit organisation based in the UK. On the website is a lot of information about um, the benefits of music listening and how to integrate it into daily life. There's also a bunch of resources that you can use to help you create these playlists, such as this form over here. And these are all downloadable from playlistforlife.org.uk as listed here. And for carers, it's always important for carers to care for themselves as well. You can use music listening to facilitate some self-care activities such as meditation. Um, meditation can be sitting in stillness, but it could also be more active in breath work, visual imagery and body scan activities. And what the music does is that it might create a time frame for the duration of your meditation practice. It might guide the breathing if you're doing breath work or it might inspire some imagery if you're doing visual imagery. Art expression to music is another fun self-care activity. You don't have to be an expert to um, engage in art expression. This could be simply putting a pen to paper and following the ups and downs of music or coloring in um, some beautiful drawings. Uh, music for relaxation is generally slow. Some people like to use nature sounds or even the sounds of their natural environment. Um, however, the most important point is that everyone relaxes to different music. So just tune into yourselves if you try these activities. Next, we move on to singing. Singing is a highly accessible modality of active music making and music therapists kind of use it a lot in their practice. Um, it's, singing is very innate to humans until we're told we can't sing. And that's usually early in our childhood, unfortunately. And in music therapy, we tend to use familiar songs as well as improvisation where appropriate. Um, a technique I like to use to encourage participation is by leaving out the final words of the end of the phrases, for example, like this. You are my son, my only son. You make me get the point. <laughs> and if we couple some active movements like clapping or stamping, um, this is an exercise of dual tasking, although people tend to move along to the music anyway. So the outcomes of singing include improved cognition, where sustaining our attention for the duration of a song. And because we're keeping up with the timing in the music, this is regulation. And improvisation is a great way to exercise cognitive flexibility. I've got to mention that improvisation is where you just kind of make up music on the spot. Um, but also switching between songs and um, that also induces uh, cognitive flexibility. And it's a highly socially act interactive activity as well, singing together. It kind of um, induces bonding as we'll see later. Um, because it's a language-based exercise, you can man maintain speech and language ability. And of course, it leads to improved psychological well-being, such as emotional expression, emotional release, um, enhanced mood, and increased self-confidence. 
Increased self-confidence is usually a result of the expression of self and being validated and accepted in a social activity, as well as the maintenance of self-identity. Here is um, a research paper about the effects of um, singing on the relationship between carers and, and people living with dementia. Um, this study has found that it improved the relationships or it was perceived that joining and singing together improved relationships between carer and person living with dementia. And this is further supported by this article that uh, describes the, that explains how singing can actually sing together, sorry, sing together um, triggers affect affect synchrony, which then leads to the release of oxytocin, which is a um, brain chemical that is related to intimacy and social bonding. Next, moving on to some rhythm based activities. Um, just because it's rhythm based, it doesn't have to be on a drum, it can be on a table as well or on a book. So free drumming is pretty self-explanatory. You can play whatever you want with your favourite songs or you can be more structured where you maintain a basic beat to a familiar song. And then some more cognitively demanding rhythm-based activities include um, making up patterns. So that can be rhythmic, taking turns making a rhythmic pattern. Or it could be sequential and not necessarily um, rhythm based. So this might be exploring different ways of playing the drum, such as tapping, knocking, smoothing with the palm, and even rumbling, which people love. And you might put that in a certain sequence and make that a pattern for um, you and a partner to imitate. And the sequential pattern could also be based on the left and right hands. very recent study on uh, based in Japan and it was a drum communication program where they got a community drum facilitator to jump in and facilitate some 30 minute sessions um, that involved free drumming as well as cues from the facilitator to play loud or soft and fast or slow. The first main finding was that it significantly improved cognitive function and this could be because it exercise, you exercise attention and self-regulation when drumming. Um, it, you need to be cognitively flexible to respond to cues. And the call and response aspect of these patterns is that you're learning and reproducing rhythmic patterns. And so this kind of helps with memory recall. Um, the second main finding was that it provided an opportunity for continued exercise in people who um, need a high level of care. And unfortunately, it also meant that the body composition um, was, uh, was affected. So the paper suggests that drumming for less than 30 minutes or ensuring an appropriate nutritional intake is necessary. The final finding is that it showed improvements in shoulder and wrist inflection, which then implies on the performance of daily activities. So like singing, rhythm-based activities can be highly social interactive and it also improves psychological well-being, the same as singing, with the inclusion of sense of accomplishment. And this is where if you're learning and creating new patterns, then, you know, that kind of contributes to a sense of accomplishment. Um, but also if playing an activity is new to a person, then engaging in new experiences always uh, facilitates a sense of accomplishment. Some tips is to incorporate turn taking where appropriate and to include concepts as fast and slow and loud and soft to exercise cognitive flexibility and regulation. These instructions can be um, provided through modeling, verbal instructions or body language. Finally, we arrive to our last activity and that is songwriting. Now, don't stress because songwriting doesn't always mean making a song from scratch. It can also mean changing the lyrics to a song that you know and love already. And this can be done by reflecting on the main message or the theme of the lyrics, 
and then creating your own lyrics to an existing song. And a tip for this is to use visual prompts where appropriate and visual prompts can be photographs um, or books, picture books, etc. Another useful tool for songwriting is to make up mnemonics where um, a person needs to remember important information because our brain is very good at encoding information through pitch and rhythm. A great example of a mnemonic is the alphabet song. We're never going to forget the alphabet now. Um, and this, in this study as well, it showed that uh, some writing together in dyads of carer and person with dementia was great for social bonding. It facilitated reflection on lived experience and reminiscence. It allowed for the expression of thoughts and feelings and also a sense of accomplishment from creating and completing a task that's new once again. The final words are to always have fun. The magic of music engagement is that it is fun. And while people are working on their cognition or social skills and so on, it never feels like it. The activities are always highly adaptable to suit a person's needs, ability and preferences. And the key for the magic to happen is to trust your intuition if you decide to use these activities with the person in your care. And lastly, I'd like to tell you about this um, current study. It's facilitated by um, the Trailblazers in Music Therapy um, based in Melbourne University. And this program slash research project uh, supports carers in providing music and reading interventions for people living with dementia and living at home. I'm not a part of this project, but I think it's really worthwhile checking out if that interests you. Here are some references that I've used for today's talk. And if you're interested in reading literature, I've um, included a link to a Google Drive. And thank you for listening to my talk today. Thank you, Gina. That was so, so interesting. And there were lots of good examples of how you can, you know, take music and use that to your, to your benefit. And I personally was interested with what you said about how you've got to be really careful with erratic changes in music and how that can agitate, you know, people with dementia. So there's lots of comments talking about the benefit of music therapy. So I'll just read a couple. Um, Meg says, um, music therapy does work. My husband who has FTD, the semantic variant, and I participated in the Homeside Music Intervention Study, which they heard about through Step Up for Dementia. She says that he now plays the piano every night um, he played it as a young boy and he listens to music then plays along and it's amazing, uh, she says, to see and hear it. So, um, and there's lots of other examples here. Um, Lynn writes, um, my husband has PPA and FTD and he still plays tunes on the guitar. He will sing out loud when happy, usually just nonsense words. He likes to listen to his music on his phone that he has collected over the years. I took him to a year two concert and he sang along to all the songs, clapping and dancing. He can't express his needs or process language or directions. Um, and then Lynn asks, is there any way we can use his music skill and knowledge to assist in his communication? Um, and so, sorry, I was listening, <laughs> but does this person still have language capacity? Uh, I'm not too I'm not too sure, but I guess the general question is: um, Can we use can people use music as a way of uh, communicating uh, need or emotion or uh, yeah, as a way of communication? Yeah, and so you know you can kind of pay attention to whether he sounds you know tuning because um. This is going way back as well, but as humans, we can pick up emotions in the way that we're producing our, so our sounds, whether it be voice tone or through singing. And so he may be in need of pain, and this might be something that you listen out for in the way that he's verbalizing, uh, vocalizing, perhaps. Yep, okay, okay. And we've got another question here, Gina. Um, Margaret says, do you have any tips for encouraging a person with FTD to imitate? slash 
participate in activities like drumming? Yeah, so it's always important to, you know, I think free drumming is a great entry point where you just pop on some music, you bang on a tabletop. And um, because the rhythms in music are so infectious, people tend to, to join in. And, um, and then that could slowly branch into, you know, maintaining a beat and then the more structured activities like, uh, like copying patterns. But it might not be like, okay, we're going to sit down and make patterns. <laughs> it might be that we have to gradually um, work our way to making patterns. Okay, okay. Um, all right, we might leave it there. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, and if you know have any other questions, we can reach out to you and, and um, provide people with the literature as well. Um, all right, we might move on. Thank you very much again, Gina. So um, our next talk, um, a little bit of a change. So we're always very, very privileged to have um, a carer come and speak to everyone, to the researchers and to, to all the families about um, what their experience is like. And today we have Jelaine um, here. So Jelaine cares for her husband who has FTD and she's very, very generously agreed to share her story and her insights uh, from her journey. So I'll hand it over to you Julaine, to tell us um, about your story. Okay, thanks, Morel. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna try to get it to um, share my screen, hopefully. It doesn't want to run Zoom and you. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. I obviously am Jelaine. My husband is um, Jeff. We've been together for um, 39 years. And obviously I'm not a, um, from Australia, but um, I grew up in San Francisco and had the benefit of a bit of travel. Um, and I happened to meet my husband at the ripe old age of 21 at an airport terminal in Rome. As it turned out, we were both traveling to Athens um, and as fate would have it, we were staying in the same hotel. The next trip happened to be to Los Angeles and I was attending university there. So the rest as they say is history and it's actually our 39th anniversary this month. Jeff was a Sydney boy and I was immediately attracted to him. I won't lie, um, definitely saw stars when we met in that terminal. He was clever and intelligent, um, very funny, handsome. And um, as you can see from one of the photos, he was very athletic. So, if you could name positive adjectives, I would tell you that that would help describe my healthy husband. Um, to his friends, he was the life of the party. He loved to party and he was regarded as one of the most talented amongst them. Um, he loved his job, which was a pilot for Qantas. And he loved the lifestyle that that provided for us. And throughout our lives, he was always very active. So he was very um, involved in sporting, um, pretty much anything on the water. He read a book every week. That's how he killed his time when he was on the airplane or sitting in hotel rooms. And he spent many hours on our boats, um, on the water, working around the farm, um, building engines. He actually brought two engines home in his suitcase over a period of about three years and built a couple engines here for our ski boat. So he could turn his hand pretty much to anything that he wanted to do. Anything he decided to do, he excelled. Um, I'll say that we had a very happy life, but the road to diagnosis with FTD was paved with many hurdles. And I'm sure that my story is not a lot different to a lot of yours. 
the hardest time in our lives, hands down, was the time between the day Jeff retired and actually getting a diagnosis just over two years later. He had retired from a job he was passionate about. He had almost 45 years as a pilot for Qantas. And um, he loved the travel. He loved flying the jet. And I often say, I suspect he actually loved her a little bit more than me. Um, he liked to go to work. But after he retired, he um, got increasingly erratic and started to get aggressive behavior, which was very um, out of his sort of character. At first we thought, all of us, including my husband, thought it was just mild depression, that he wasn't happy in retirement. But it started within a month of his actual retirement. And within a few short months, it was clear that he was actually crashing into what everybody thought was severe depression. Sadly, his GP um, of almost 20 years assumed that I was exaggerating about Jeff's uh, deteriorating behavior. Um, he thought that I was not coping with having Jeff home 24 seven, but he knew us better than that. Uh, Jeff had a blood disorder and we used to have to go to the GP every month so that Jeff could keep his um, uh, pilot's license. So um, he pretty much rejected anything I had to say about Jeff's deteriorating health. And really I fell to a level of despair. Um, one of the ways I dealt with that was I was hoping at some stage I could reach out for help. And so I started to keep a daily journal of Jeff's deteriorating behaviors. Um, in the end, I actually did that for two years. It was quite therapeutic for me. Um, and it ended up becoming a diagnostic tool. So um, at that time, I knew absolutely nothing about FTD. I had never even heard of this as an early onset dementia. Um, I knew that there were different kinds of dementia. I had no idea how many different kinds there were, but I would really suggest that Jeff's doctor should have known. I would have expected Jeff's doctor to know something about these diseases. Um, and as it turned out, some of Jeff's and my closest friends also noticed that he was falling into a bit of depression it was getting quite melancholy and disengaged. And as I said, they knew him to be the life of the party. Um, so we happened to be at a barbecue a few months before things went a bit pear-shaped and the host couple bailed me up in the kitchen and basically said, can you not see what's going on? Can you not see he has depression? Um, you know, why aren't you doing anything about it? He looks terrible. What is wrong? And, um, I'll admit it, I lost it. I wasn't prepared for that. Um, and I didn't know where to turn. But those same friends have since become my strongest support network. And I say that without qualification. Once they realized the truth, they actually rallied to provide me a safety net and to help me cope with what became our daily reality. Um, I'm the first to admit, I left it too long. Um, that was largely out of guilt. I felt very disloyal. A lot of people were encouraging me to make that phone call to emergency and reach out for help. Um, but I loved my husband and I was scared. When I finally did make that call, the system failed us and it failed us badly. Um, having said that, oddly, one of the biggest advantages since diagnosis for us turned out to be that um, Jeff ended up being detained in hospital as an involuntary patient for just shy of nine months. The long story short, things continued to deteriorate. We had an accident one morning. Um, I was injured. I convinced him to call an ambulance. Um, sadly, he wouldn't let the ambulance take me away. The ambulance 
officer said they would call the police. Jeff still wouldn't let him take me away. So they called for the police and things basically went from there. Uh, the police were bullies, outright bullies. And even though I said my very first words that I did not wish to make a statement, but I was quite concerned my husband had dementia or something similar. Um, and the senior ambulance officer said they'd already called for support that they were going to schedule him. They also suspected he had a mental illness, possibly dementia. The police continued to be heavy handed for a good six months after this. And when they took him to emergency, they actually told the staff there that Jeff had been violent, which was an outright lie. Um, but the hospital put that in his records and then continued to treat him as though he had been violent. He had, in fact, become quite hostile. He was non-compliant, but having said that, my husband had been a captain for 25 years and was quite used to people following his orders. Um, didn't like people telling him what to do. Um, and at the time he was actually suffering quite severe psychosis. But again, the doctors didn't actually think I knew what I was talking about. And so when I kept telling them that Jeff was seeing things um, or that he suspected that they were all attracted to me, for instance, um, or that he felt that one of the nurses actually was trying to harm him, they wrote that off as me again, overreacting. Um, but in fact, when we went to hospital, and this is not an exaggeration, I don't think he had closed his eyes for about two months. And that's genuine. He had not slept. He had gotten to such a state that he no longer could actually sleep. Um, but once we got into the hospital system, life improved dramatically. So those first four months, not so much. But because he was hard and because I refused to allow them to place him in residential care, they ended up transferring us to a geriatric um, specialist psychiatric ward. And things really improved for us there. About two weeks in, um, nothing was changing. And this, his treating psychologist made a comment and I happened to walk out and follow him to his office and pretty much just fell apart. And I said, I couldn't understand why everybody was treating my husband so poorly, why nobody was helping us. Um, you know, why, why was nobody actually trying to figure out what was going on? And in the meantime, um, when I say the system before had failed us, the only way we ended up getting some test results that we needed like a brain scan, MRI, um, the PET scan, was that I happened to know some very senior doctors. And after three and a half months of absolutely nothing happening, I made a phone call and within a week, all of the tests we had been waiting for happened. And I'm sorry, but that just shouldn't be how it is. Nobody should have to rely on their contacts to actually get some answers. Um, in the end, the treating psychiatrist at the new facility actually listened to me. He got to know us a bit. And after a couple hours, he looked at me and he said, okay, I'll change his medication today. I'll work with you. Gave me a, a straight answer and said, look, it's probably gonna take several months to, for us to work out which medications work for him, what the right dose is. But if you want him home, and I believe I can get him safe, we'll get him home. We owe that doctor. We owe him the, the last five years together because really things were not looking good five years ago. Um, in those five years, Jeff turned 70 and I turned 60 and we had lovely family celebrations. Um, several of our grandchildren have been born and really life is very different for us, but it's still good and we're still home together. Um, the other thing that happened in that time was I also was not sleeping well, largely out of worry. And I found Frontier, oddly enough, from a link that was on a US dementia site that I happened to find 
from a academic article in some obscure site in the middle of the night one night. I spoke to the new psychiatrist about that and he said he would look into it. Um, he contacted the Brain and Mind Center, found out what had to occur for us to get a referral, sent the referral in, followed it up, and really um, we owe a lot to that doctor for helping us get to where we are today. But when I say those nine months actually benefited us, um, that's a genuine truth. And the main benefit has been been that Jeff ha lives in a constant institutionalized. Um, and because of that, he's very placid, he's very compliant, he takes his medication and he sticks to his routine. So that brings me to our time with Frontier. That started, as I said, um, about four and a half years ago now, five years ago now. And um, our first few consults actually happened to be with John. And we were very lucky because um, I mentioned to, to the people that were interviewing me at the time that Jeff was quite intellectual. Obviously, he was a pilot of 747 jumbo jets. And he read a lot and he was just, he was very smart. He was never going to believe a diagnosis of dementia, never. But nobody was actually showing him why he was giving that diagnosis. And John spent some time with us on the second day and showed um, us on a double screen pictures of a healthy 65 year old male and Jeff's brain and talk through the changes and the sort of behaviors that went with that part of his brain that he could see clear atrophy in. My husband walked out of that room actually believing that he did in fact have frontotemporal dementia. Um, and that has helped me immensely in working through issues over time. Um, Jeff seeing it with his own eyes, actually looking at his brain scan with his own eyes facilitated him accepting the disease and accepting treatment. Having said that, the hardest thing we do every year for our annual visit is get Jeff back on that table for the brain scan. And I think partly it's fear out of what we will learn um, as this disease progresses. The other thing that went really well for us with Frontier is um, we were referred to an excellent specialist neurologist who knows what's going on with all the research, who understands all the various medications um, and their effects and was willing to work with us on what actually worked best for Jeff and what would help keep him home with me. Um, so what have I learned? I have to say FTD for me has been a constant exercise in discovery and learning. Um, I'm a bit academic that way, I'll admit, um, but I, I won't lie, I get frustrated I get angry, I get very weary, um, and this year in particular, I get very sad. I see my husband's decline, and I've actually come to the realization now, about 12 months ago, that um, I'm no longer his wife. Now I'm his carer. And that was very, very hard for me. But I know that he needs me to be strong for him. I know he needs me to keep fighting his battles. And I know that he needs me to actually keep trying to stay on the front foot so that we can keep him home, hopefully for forever. Um, some of the things that have worked for us, first thing absolutely was a really rigid routine. He takes his medications at the same time every day um, and we spread out his medication so he has lower doses through the day, which I have found works much better for him, keeps him calm and stable without having sort of peaks and troughs. He eats um, three meals a day at the same time, often the same very bland food, which in itself told us a lot about him because you couldn't have fed him spicier food if you tried before FTD, but now he eats no spice at all. 
He eats an awful lot of sugar, however, which is not good for him. But um, as everybody's heard today, that's not abnormal for this disease. Um, he goes to bed every night at 9.30, really rigid on that. And most evenings he'll sleep 10 hours. If we have a really good night or he's had a very busy day, he'll sleep 11, 12 hours, which is good. He only watches um, NCIS now and cricket on TV, nothing else at all. And that's fine, I'm good with that. Um, he used to be quite a social butterfly. And while I understand that that's probably would have been a good thing to try and maintain that, he's very ashamed of who he's become. And um, so he very rarely will leave the four walls of our house. And I'm actually okay with that because he's quite calm. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, what worked for me was I reached out. And, you know, um, sadly, there are a lot of people, especially family and loved ones, who will disappoint you and it's all too hard for them. They don't want to know, it's too confronting, they're too sad, whatever it might be. Um, but you might be surprised who becomes your lifeline. And for us, we live on a small farm with three houses. Uh, the girls have really stepped up being here on the farm with uh, four of our grandchildren. Um, we have a son out west who is really struggling to come to terms with it. And really, I've just had to let him take his time to work it out for himself. Um, build a really strong and supportive care team. I said what changed for me really was the day the psychiatrist at the specialist facility said, we'll work it out what's best for Jeff. Um, that really helped. He also engaged me in every treatment decision and Jeff's care team now and the specialist neurologist and the um, occupational therapist and that they talk to Jeff and I try not to answer for him. And then they actually look at me and ask me if he gave him an answer, was it true? In Jeff's mind, it was true, but often it doesn't really resemble the truth. Um, and really what I've learned from this entire experience and everything I've studied is um, every individual case of FTD is exactly that individual. So while I do continue to study and try to learn about this disease, I also am very observant of what's happening with my husband and just trying to manage his behaviors um, and his general health. Uh, the other thing I'd say, and I'm not great at it, uh, patience and tolerance are pretty important. My mother would have told you that patience is definitely not one of my strengths, um, but you need a lot of patience to live with FTD. And I suspect that even if you have made the decision for whatever reason for your uh, loved one to be in institutional care, that you still require a lot of patience to deal with that loved one. Um, my husband does things now that absolutely would have sent him over the edge when he was healthy. And I have found that the only thing that works for him and for us as a family is for me to treat him as though he's one of our toddler grandchildren. I'm constantly reminding him, um, table manners, slow down with his eating, um, don't talk with food in his mouth. Uh, whatever it is, I remind him gently and he corrects his behavior. So um, it works. Um, some of you would have noticed earlier, I asked a question about shadowing. And really, shadowing is the one thing that one day just might push me over the edge. My husband was a pilot and was away a lot. And that absolutely drives me crazy now that I can turn around and literally bump into him as if I take a step forward. Um, he has to be able to see me all the time. It would be driving him crazy that I've come out to my office for this symposium today. Um, but on those days, I take a walk on the farm. Um, I might go sit somewhere uh, away from the house because he won't walk very far and just engage with nature, some slow, deep breathing. Or if I'm really having a bad day, 
I'll just tell them I have to go get groceries. I have to pick up scripts, whatever it is. I hop in the car and I go to town for half an hour, an hour. Occasionally, I might even go get a coffee or something when we're not in COVID lockdown. Um, and I just take a time out because uh, really, if I break, who's going to look after my husband? He would end up in institutional care and he would hate that. Um, and following on from that, I have to say, respite, you know, I've, I've heard so many stories about carers and things over the years, um, but respite really is so critical because if you allow yourself to deteriorate, if I let myself get to that breaking point, then I know that everything here would implode. So for me, I'm a little strange. Um, I actually enrolled in university and am just about to take my final, final exam for a law degree. It works for me, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend everybody decide to go do a professional qualification as respite. Um, but I became very impassioned. Our experience really dismayed me. I've had 30 years in the New South Wales public sector um, at an executive level for 20 of those and I could not navigate the system. The laws are really very substandard for what we as carers know we need. And that was actually alluded to in the previous session. Um, but, you know, as a carer, I actually know what will keep our family afloat, what will be my husband's best interests. Um, we do have, I've always been very cautious that way. We do. Do have wills. We've had wills since I was 18 years old. Um, I'm about to go do advanced directives while my husband still has quite high cognitive scores. So um, I have to say, for me, it became about getting a law degree and hopefully going out and changing the law. Um, it gives me purpose for the future and it gives me something to give back after this disease has taken so much from us. Um, the other thing that works for me briefly is um, faith. I have a great deal of faith. Um, I'm quite devout and that has helped me a lot, I have to say. Um, but the other final thing really is hope. I'm a glass half full kind of person. And the one thing that really gives me hope, I have to say, is that um, many years ago, not just shy of 60 years ago, we were all taken to Stanford Hospital where my grandfather was read his last rites. And what I learned later when I got older was after the family left, my grandmother was asked if my granddad survived the night, which obviously they didn't think would happen because he'd just been given his last rites, that um, they wanted to trial a new treatment on him. My grandfather had metastas metastatic cancer that had started his skin cancer. And um, the next morning they did start that therapy and my grandfather lived 17 more years. That therapy happened to be chemotherapy. And you know, I've, I live in constant hope that my husband might be that person for FTD, that, um, that we're on the precipice of diagnostic tools to help people who come after us. Oh, that we're on the precipice of a breakthrough treatment that might help people live better lives with this disease and eventually maybe even a cure. But, um, you know, I have a lot of reason to hope. hope because I've actually lived through a terminal. My grandfather, when we lost him, was in his 80s. Um, so, in closing, I just want to say I know every single day how blessed I am and how blessed we are in spite of FTD. And every single day I count my blessings. We're surrounded by loved ones. We've lived a long and happy life together. Um, we're older, we're not young. We were financially secure. My husband was retired. Um, we had traveled the world together for obvious reasons. He's a pilot. Um, we've made so many happy memories. We're watching our grandchildren grow up. 
you know, um, and I'm on a few care sites on social media. Yeah, and I see how hard so many other people have security we have who have to give up jobs, um, who live in small towns and have to live through the embarrassment that was FTD. We've been blessed. We haven't experienced any of that. So, um, you know, I would say for me, FTD has not been entirely negative. It's sad, it's tragic for us, but you know, we're going okay. My husband's going okay. And um, I still live in hope that, well, we, we make small goals. Every year we make small goals. And now we're just shy of 12 months away from our 40th anniversary. And that's our next goal. Thank you very much. Shalane, I really wanted to thank you on behalf of you know, everyone here, the researchers and, and everyone in the audience. Thank you so, so much for telling your story. It's so moving. It's so, there's so much to it as well. I mean, you really brought across the, 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 the complexities of, of every stage of the, the illness. And we want to thank you so much for that. You've done a wonderful, wonderful thing for um, raising awareness by telling your story. Thank you very much, Jelaine. Thank you, Mara. Um, so we'll, we'll finish up there with um, Jelaine and we might start our next, um, uh, well, the very last bit of our um, uh, session today, and that is the Q&A panel. So uh, we'll just give a few moments for the panel to come on the screen. Um, so we have, uh, yeah, Dr. Claire O'Connor, um, Olivier, and we also have Michelle Taylor, and we also have um, Rebecca Ahmed. Uh, so I'll just, um, so thank you guys for, um, joining us on the panel here. I'll just introduce uh, each of you. So we heard from Professor Olivier Piguet earlier today and Dr. Claire O'Connor. Uh, I wanted to introduce uh, Michelle Taylor. So Michelle Taylor is uh, the, the Western Australia State Manager for Client Services uh, from Dementia Australia. And she is the National uh, FTD Portfolio Lead. And thank you, Michelle, for being here. And we also have Rebecca Ahmed. So, uh, Professor Rebecca Ahmed is a neurologist uh, and she's also the director of the Memory and Cognition Clinic uh, at the Royal Prince Alfred uh, Hospital. And uh, we also have, uh, I'd like to invite just one more um, uh, panellist and that's Professor Kiri Ballard, who we heard from earlier. So. Hello. Thanks, Kiri. Hi, Kiri. So, so we heard to be on the All right. Well, uh, we've had, so thank you everyone for being here. We've had lots of questions come through during the day. So uh, we might just make a start with um, some of these questions. I thought we could start off, um, actually, I'll give this one to you, uh, Olivier. Uh, some people have asked about diagnosis and um, what the best methods are for arriving at, a, at, at an FTD diagnosis? What, what actually happens? Oh, that's, a, that's a, a, quite a complex question to start with. Um, I, I, I think what we've found and what has been alluded to across these different talks is that there isn't one single test, one source of information that will give you the diagnosis. I think what is important is a range of investigations. So there, there's the, the, the medical aspects so of the, the, the examination by the neurologist, by the geriatrician, um, by a psychiatrist. But in addition, there's a need for looking at um, behavior overall, um, looking at different aspects of cognition, 
we talked about memory language executive functions there's a need to talk to um, a loved one a family member um, a partner children uh, that that will be a big source of information um, and then uh, we now have access to a range of investigative tools like brain imaging that will give you the uh, some clues about whether or not there is some atrophy in the brain and where this atrophy is. And uh, more recently, the development of biomarkers, uh, so markers in the blood where you can detect the presence of some proteins that will also indicate whether, what, what, whether there is pathology in the brain and what type of pathology there is. Um, and also genetic testing, um, as we talked about a little bit, but not too much, um, there is a genetic component to dementia, um, albeit in a very small proportion, but that's also a way to exclude whether or not there's a genetic cause for that. So it's, it's a combination of a number of, of sources of, of information. And also, I think what is really important is the, the repeated assessment. So that see how things evolve over time will give you a, a great deal of information for that. Yeah, um, I know, thank you, Olivia. I know Rebecca, uh, Dr. Rebecca Ahmed, you're also you know, in your clinic, you're diagnosing uh, and seeing patients all the time. Um, following on from that question, um, what, in your opinion, why is diagnosing FTD so difficult, such a difficult task? Uh, thanks, Muriel. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that make it difficult. Often early on, the behavioural changes can <sighs> by subtle and um, carers and family members they don't want their loved one to have dementia and so often they'll minimize the symptoms and often as well I think one of the problems with diagnosis is um, the healthcare setting isn't always set up to make a diagnosis so sometimes there are doctors and health professionals who want to avoid making a diagnosis of dementia. So they'll make a diagnosis of depression or anxiety, not realizing that that actually prolongs the agony for the families in not getting a diagnosis, but knowing that there is a problem. Um, another issue is that um, often FTD can overlap with other neurodegenerative conditions. So we see sometimes people can have movement disorders, Sometimes they can have memory problems, which can be confused with Alzheimer's disease. So it's a very um, heterogeneous disorder that makes diagnosis really difficult. I mean, I think things are improving. Um, we use PET scanning a lot to help with diagnosis. And there are blood and CSF biomarkers, which can tell us the underlying pathology. So I think things are improving in making an earlier diagnosis. Yes. Um, so, would any would anyone else on the panel like to contribute to um, that question of just the general kind of topic of diagnosis? I think just one more comment to add to what Rebecca has just said: the the difficulty and, and what Julianos has demonstrated is every, every story is different, and and also because. If you compare FTD to Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease, we know the pathology. There's one type of changes in the brain. We know that there are two proteins involved and it's fairly standard. And the presentation in, in people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease is fairly predictable. There are some um, subgroups which, are, um, which have slightly unusual presentations, but on the whole, Alzheimer's disease is a more homogeneous disorder or disease, whereas frontotemporal dementia, we have the difficulty of dealing with clinically multiple presentations, language problems or behavior problems or a mix of that with movement problems, and then also related to multiple pathologies. And these things don't seem to be talking to each other very well. So there's a, a, a challenges at, at multiple levels. That's what makes it more complex. Yes. Um, so related. So related to what we're talking about um, on the topic of you know moving on to some genetics, someone has asked. 
Um, is FTD likely to affect you if one of your parents has it? Um, and is there ways of testing to tell if you're at risk? Uh, so I might hand this over to you again, Olivier, about how um, this question. Um, yes, so, so as, as I just mentioned, the in, in, in dementia in general, there's a small group of people where there's um, there have been genes that have been identified that we know that if a person has a genetic as a mutation on these genes, the likelihood of transmitting the, this abnormality to the next generation is about fifty percent. So that's what is called autosomal dominant inheritance, and so the, the, and we can see when we look at uh, generation to generation, the transmission across these multiple generations where people will develop the disease. And um, overall, in dementia, there's about 5 to 10% of people with this pattern of inheritance. So it means that overall, most people who will have dementia during life uh, is, is non-genetic. In FTD, the, the risk is slightly greater, particularly for people presenting with a behavioral presentation. We know that in this group, there's a genetic component, there's a strong family history where there's a transmission from generation to generation, about 30 to 40%. If you have a language presentation, it's much, much smaller. Um, so, and we also, know of the main genes that have been that are involved in frontal temporal dementia. So there are about three or four genes that now we commonly test for. So uh, and with the cost of genetic testing that is uh, decreasing every every year, uh, it's it's much easier and much um, much um, much more affordable to test for, for these genes. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks, Olivier. So changing, changing topic again, um, there's been lots of questions around behaviour support. So um, Claire, I might ask you this one. So someone has asked, would increasing social gatherings and involvement, I guess social involvement, uh, assist in the slowdown of symptoms? That's a toughie. I can't say whether or not that would slow down the symptoms. Um, I guess that would depend on the individual and whether or not that would be effective or not. Um, I think a lot of people with FTD um, tend to sort of turn inwards rather than wanting to be seeking out social stuff, for instance. That might be a bit challenging for people. Um, but then again, there's a lot of research about the benefit of social engagement for people as well. So I'm not sure of the answer to that question. I guess it would be very um, individual and specific to each family as to whether or not that would be useful. Mm -hmm. um, also, Claire, so we've got a, a comment um, and question here. So my husband hums or sings constantly. She, um, that's called vocalisation. I don't believe he uh, is even aware that he's doing it. I sometimes try to sing a different song, but he always goes back to the same song from his childhood. Uh, what other distractions would you suggest for these kinds of uh, repetitive vocalisations? Um, Kiri might have something to add to this after, but um, that's, I would just say that um, maybe a couple of things on that. I guess I would try engagement in activities. So if someone's really engaged in something different, maybe they are not thinking about doing that humming thing. Um, so maybe trying to find some activities that would really, like I said earlier, uh, really pique that person's interest and really fit within their capabilities. Um, then perhaps they might be focused on what they're doing in front of them then and not be doing the humming. Um, and the other thing I might say is that that might have to be one of the things that you just have to um, try and change your own interpretation of it I guess and try and just let it wash over you a little bit because it's some something like that might be a bit difficult to change and there might be more important
things that are perhaps more dangerous or risky um, if someone's doing something finances for instance or stealing something from the shops or driving when they shouldn't be maybe there's other behaviors that should be the focus more of actually trying to change stuff and whereas humming could be really annoying if someone's doing the same song over and over again but I'm not sure if actually you'd be able to change that for instance um, so maybe some of the times it's about sort of recognizing what can't be changed and sort of accepting that um, and then focusing on what really needs to be sort of maybe have a replacement behaviour put in its place. But definitely try and engagement, engagement in an activity that that person could really focus on might distract them from doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, lots of good strategies. I see you also nodding, Kiri. Is, uh, is there anything that you'd like to add to this um, topic? No, no, I think, I think Claire covered that quite well. That's, that's, Okay, um, so uh, we've just had a question come through back onto the topic of genetics. Um, is it possible to have a genetic mutation that is not identified yet? For example, one generation level with two out of four with BBFTD and one out of four with Parkinson's, but genetic testing did not identify a known genetic mutation. Um, I mean, and yeah, definitely. Um, so we know about we know the major mutations that cause FTD, but there are um, mutations in all kinds of neurological diseases that are be, being discovered every year. So it's possible that there could be a genetic mutation that we haven't discovered yet. Um, now that there are new genetic um, techniques like whole um, genome sequencing where they sequence your whole genome it's probably more and more that these um, mutations will come to light but it's possible to have a family history but not find a causative mutation okay um just going back to you uh claire we have a question about apathy so um Hemlata says that her husband uh lays in bed all day and doesn't do anything. What are the uh, what are some suggestions for, for dealing with apathy in this way? Apathy is a really tough one to deal with um, and try and get people to engage in anything. Um, so I'd be looking at again, trying to look at really specific activities that that person just might pique a little bit of interest. Um, I'd be looking at changing expectations around what sort of engagement you'd be hoping from that person. So that person might not be able to engage in the same way that they used to be able to. So even if you do get some engagement, um, maybe change the expectation for how long that person might do an activity, for example. Um, and then maybe I'd be looking at specific uh, strategies like prompting. So um, visual prompts, actually getting out the activity materials and showing it to the person before even mentioning it. Um, because sometimes if you just talk about something and say, let's go and do this, but they can't see anything to do with that activity, it's a bit abstract and it's just too difficult. It's easy for the person just to say no. Um, sometimes physical prompts can help as well. Um, actually putting activity materials into a person's hand sometimes can help that just stimulate that go button and actually help them to start doing an activity. Um, yeah, demonstrating, as I said before, um, during my talk, like clearing spaces so there's nothing else distracting in the space of the person it's, uh, and then putting the materials just for that activity out on a table can help. And then depending on what the person's communication needs are, sometimes using non-verbal communication to get engagement in activity, sometimes using words if that helps for that person. So it just really depends on the individual. Um, but it's definitely a tough one um, to work with, I would say. Apathy is a tough one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the most common things that across all the disease uh, FTE subtypes. Thanks, thanks Claire. Um, Kiri, I'm asking this one. So Peggy writes, she says, after two years of being nonverbal, my husband has answered some questions. Um, do you recommend following up with a speech therapist, even though there's a, you know, mostly he's nonverbal? Uh, yeah, so probably the best step, um, first step would be to, uh, for you to call a speech pathologist and just talk through a bit more about 
what things have been like with his speech and language um, earlier and you know what has happened in those two years with his communication and his general behavior and the contexts around where he has responded to some questions uh, and getting it so the speech pathologist could get a feel for um, you know what that's looking like and whether um, you know there is any advice they can give to you on on what that might mean and what you might be able to um, to try going forward. So I, I would recommend that as a first step, just getting, um, just having a conversation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kiri. Um, so we had an earlier question around um, conversation with um, the person with FTD. Um, so how can you, how can you be honest with a patient with a diagnosis when the BBFTD patient thinks all is okay with him and you cannot reason with him? Um, I might ask you, Rebecca, is how do you deal with this challenge in the clinic of being honest with the, the patient? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I guess the first thing to remember is one of the things that we use to help make the diagnosis is a lack of insight. So we know that patients may not necessarily recognize the changes in behavior or the cognitive deficits that they've got. Um, I mean, I always tell patients and their carers together what the diagnosis is, but then I meet with the carer separately because often what you find when you tell a patient that they have FTD, and then you ask if they have any questions, they say, no, when can we go home? Whereas, um, so they, and I, no one knows why they respond in that way, but it's to do with the kind of lack of insight. Um, and I, it's important to explain to the carers that that is part of the diagnosis and that um, they've been told they have the diagnosis, so you're not keeping anything from them, but then, use that as a way to then interact with them. So there's no point, um, for example, telling the patient constantly that they've got this diagnosis because in some patients, no matter how much you tell them, they won't accept it. Um, but it's just being aware of that with the carer and then the carer needs to know that when they're interacting with them behaviorally and also putting in safety measures and things like that. So often it's kind of striking that balance and making the care aware that that's part of the diagnosis that they won't know what's going on. And it can be difficult. And a lot of carers um, try for many years to get the patient to accept the diagnosis. And some patients never accept the diagnosis. And it's often also important that carers need to understand that so they can put, for example, financial um, mechanisms in place so the patients don't go and get scammed by scammers or give money away or um, also put other safety measures in place. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, so I might just go on to the very next one. Uh, and I might ask this one of you, Olivia, because it's a more research-based question. Um, so I can't remember who wrote this, but um, uh, this lady says, my husband has PPA, the logopenic variant, does Frontier regard PPA, the logopenic variant, as an FTD? Uh, there's lots of similarities, uh, but there's some marked differences, she says. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a few words, but I think Kiri also could, could um, um, add to what I'm going to say. Um, yes, there is a lot of overlap in terms of clinical presentation from, and, and I'll, I'll leave the clinical overlap aside because I think that's for Kiri to answer. She's a specialist in language. I'll just talk about what is happening in the brain between these two. Um, so whether PPA logopenic is part of frontal temporal dementia. So in the brain of uh, 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 someone diagnosed with PPA logopenic, what we find is actually the same pathology as that is found in people with Alzheimer's disease with the memory problems. Uh, so it's the same um, accumulation, of, accumulation of the same proteins in the brain that 
is found in, in typical Alzheimer's disease, um, which is a completely different category compared to what you the, compared to the changes you find in the brains of people diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia. So if you look after death, if you compare these to the brains of people with PPA, logopenic presentations, and people with frontal temporal lobar degeneration, as it's called pathologically, the, the, these will be very different disorders. So it means that in terms of devising or designing uh, novel therapies, medications, it, it's, it's, it's acting on very different mechanisms. So when you design a, a drug trial, that's why it's important to make sure that you recruit people with the, the right pathologies to be able to test whether or not the novel medication is effective or not. Because if you give the medication to someone who's presenting in the same way, but not quite and doesn't have the right pathologies, then you might find that your medication is not effective not because you're not, it's not effective, but because you've given it to the wrong people, essentially. Um, so pathologically, they, they're different things. Uh, PPA logopenic is part of the family of Alzheimer's disease, whereas uh, the other forms of language presentations of PPA are part of frontal temporal dementia. Then clinically, Kiri will be able to tell us a little bit more about the overlap and distinctions between these two subtypes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, it is true that it's very difficult to differentiate them, particularly very early on. Um, as I think Rebecca mentioned, you know, the symptoms can be quite subtle early on, so they're hard to differentiate. And they come down to having quite um, quite a lot of expertise to be able to pick apart the differences, but, but they become more evident as, as the people go on. So I think what we find in the um, people with logopenia is, you know, this um, really significant word finding difficulty where they're, they're uh, you know, their conversation is very impacted by just not being able to come up with the words. And often, um, the words are affected so that sounds in the words get jumbled up so that they will, you know, drop a sound out or they'll, you know, bring a sound that comes late in a word and put it too early. And so the word will get all jumbled. Um, and I think you also start to see um, some issues with um, potentially um, processing speech sounds so that you know, they benefit from you having you sort of slowing down, making sure there's no auditory, dis no sound distractions in the environment, uh, because they have to focus quite um, intently to to process the speech and to hold it in their memory, so that you know they have a difficulty with holding information in their memory to work on it, and uh, being able to sort of process language as it's coming at them. So, you know, those sorts of issues. And then, you know, the, whereas the people with um, the non-fluent variant very often uh, have issues, uh, a lot of their speech issues are related to the movement problem that they have. So it's, it's not necessarily that they can't use their muscles, probably eating fine and drinking fine, but their brain is having difficulty controlling what their muscles are doing. And so the errors that you see are a little bit different. They're still having trouble coming up with words, but their speech becomes um, disfluent, well, more disfluent, um, and a bit distorted. So the sounds are coming out sort of right, but not quite right. So you sort of, they tend to have quite good intelligibility, um, but their speech is just less clear and less precise. Um, and then they, they tend to have, start to get a lot shorter sentences with grammatical errors. So, so it's those speech errors where, you know, you're flipping sounds around versus just not producing the sounds very well because you haven't controlled your articulators very well. That's very difficult to differentiate. And so, you know, I think that's where, um, you know, it's, it's even challenging for speech pathologists. So we've been doing a lot of work trying to develop some more um, objective tools that can help us with that. Uh, but it, it becomes more evident as they go along. And then I think what happens, of course, is as time goes on, um, Obviously, these um, these pathologies in the brain do spread, 
And so sometimes you get a bit of emerging. Uh, so, you know, some, some of the pathology is spreading into some of the other areas of the brain. So you can actually start to get these mixed cases. And so you can have someone with logopenic aphasia who has, um, you know, has an Alzheimer's pathology with, with um, you know, the pathology start to affect the areas that control these um, speech and language areas at the back of the brain. And as the pathology travels um, more forward, they can start to develop some of these other uh, behaviours that make it make them look like they're a bit of a mixture of things. So that complicates it as well. Um, I hope that addressed your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kiri. It's obviously quite complex you know, disentangling these uh, conditions. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Michelle, a question. We had a question earlier around um, education, uh, which is, you know, obviously what we're doing now, but also the role of um, Dementia Australia. So someone has asked, how can we educate physicians uh, to consider FTE? Um, so I guess, edu you know, educating the broader community uh, and medical community about FTD. Um, and this lady said um, FTD was not even considered as a, as a diagnosis uh, for her mother until they just stumbled upon a specialist. So um, can you give us a bit of an overview of, of services and education that's currently happening in, in Dementia Australia? Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, Professor Olivier um, touched on this earlier around the complexities of diagnosing um, FTD. And I think that's the reason why, um, because it is so complicated uh, it's often not front of mind um, for a lot of general practitioners and it really does take the specialists who work in the area to, um, to be aware and to diagnose. Uh, in terms of information and education, it's obviously uh, really important for carers and families, um, but, but also for the professionals working in the area. Um, Dementia Australia has a range of education uh, and information available on our website. Um, via our library services, we've developed um, library guides which specifically focus on frontotemporal dementias um, and group together resources um, in, in one location um, that target different, um, different audiences as well. Um, we do some understanding dementia uh, courses, but we also have a frontotemporal dementia specific uh, family education course that we run online. Um, which is more targeted to the frontotemporal dementias because uh, it doesn't, you know, we, we cover it in our general um, information sessions, but it's always good to have a particular focus um, because it is um, presents quite differently. Uh, and then obviously our counselling services, our National Dementia Helpline um, number where people can reach out and ask questions. Uh, if, if it's um, pre-diagnosis, they might have some questions that, uh, about things that they're noticing in their loved one on how they might go about getting a diagnosis or who they might go to so they can reach out to the National Dementia Helpline uh, and go through that information. Um, we also have our post-diagnostic support um, services, which is really um, tailored to each individual um, or their carer who um, wants to participate in that support. Uh, in terms of professionals, I think it's just elevating the, the voice of um, all, all people living with dementia and, um, and their families and carers um, and really um, reaching out to the professional networks and providing education through um, lots of different um, avenues, such as the Frontier Group, um, as well as uh, our Centre for Dementia Learning um, and um, getting them to connect in with the information and, and different sessions that are happening, um, as well as making it really available on our website as well. Thanks, Michelle. And how do people um, uh, get in touch with the services that you had mentioned? Is it calling the helpline? Is it a, an email? Yeah, so that it, it's um, we try to make it as easy as possible to, to make a referral. So we don't re require referrals from medical practitioners. People can self-refer. Um, carers that, um, can reach out. People living with dementia can reach out. Um, they can contact our National Dementia Helpline on 1800 100 500. That's open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, local time, no matter where somebody lives within Australia, um, as well as um, you can connect to our website, which is dementia.org.au, um, and make a referral, a self-referral, or medical practitioners can make referrals online as well. Um, so whether they're connecting via the helpline um, or via our website, um, either way, they can make a referral and be contacted back um, by one of our dementia support specialists. Okay, great. So it's quite, it's easy to access. It's just through the, the helpline. Um, that's and we might that's right. put that in the link uh, in the chat below as well. 
Um, so we, we had a, a question come in actually before this webinar about eating changes in uh, FTD. And I know, Rebecca, this is your kind of area of research. So uh, we had someone say that, you know, with the kind of um, increase in sweet foods and salty foods uh, that they were noticing with their person with FTD, they wondered whether they should try and actually curb um, the nature of the food that the person eats and the amount. Is it generally recommended that you control that? Um, thanks, Maya. Um, so we've done a lot of research and patients, um, particularly with behavioural variant FTD, but the other forms of FTD can develop a strong sweet preference and also a preference for fatty food. Um, what we found is that those changes aren't necessarily bad um, because what they do is likely affect people's underlying lipid levels, so their cholesterol levels and their triglyceride levels. And what we know is that lipids can be a source of energy for the nerves in the brain. And we've done some studies showing that, in fact, having a slightly higher cholesterol level may improve your survival. The other thing that we know is that patients with FTD, despite eating huge amounts of food, they do put on some weight, but not to the degree that a normal person would put on if they ate that amount of sweet and fatty food. So we think they also have an increase in their metabolic rate. So probably those eating changes are a way of counteracting an increased metabolic rate. Um, so obviously you don't want patients to eat like enormous amounts of sweet or fatty food, but we mostly tell carers that not to worry too much about it and not to get into fights about trying to control it um, because often it's a behaviour that the patients will continue with right till the very end and it may not necessarily be that bad. Okay. Yeah, so general, you know, don't don't try and control it too much because there's something else kind of going on there with the eating yeah. changes. Absolutely. Okay. And I mean, there's so much more to worry about. So I wouldn't get into fights about the food. I think just kind of make sure it's not huge amounts. Um, but a little bit or a moderate amount isn't too much to worry about. Okay. Um so the, the questions are a little bit all over the place, but I have one here um, about uh, intervention. So uh, Isabel says, I have heard about gene therapy and genetic engineering. Are there any researchers studying or working on this at the moment? Is it even possible to change? Um, yeah, so absolutely. Um, in some exciting news, um, there are a couple of clinical trials using gene therapy. So these are for patients who have a known um, granulin mutation, which is one of the mutations that causes FTD. And what it involves is attaching a normal copy of the gene to a viral vector, which is kind of like a transport mechanism. And you inject that into the body. And the aim is that that normal gene will get taken up by the cells to replace the faulty copy and either um, slow the progression or improve symptoms or eventually maybe even be a cure. Um, so we're lucky at Frontier, we're running the granulin trial and there are a couple of more gene trials in the pipeline for patients with mapped mutations as well and also the C9-off 72 mutation. So these trials take years to come but I mean at the beginning of 2020 there were no trials and now there are about four trials so I think it is an exciting time. Thanks, Rebecca. And I think we have some information about those trials on our, on our website for people to refer to. Um, so we're coming to the, the sort of... Uh, um, if people have any more questions, please pop them in the, in the Q&A. Um, we'll just ask a few more. So Janet has asked, um, is testing, uh, so neuropsychological testing, is that mainly for FTV or for Alzheimer's disease or both? Um, as the neuropsychologist, Olivia, I might hand this one over to you <laughs> to just explain a bit about neuropsychological testing. So um, for anyone coming for a neuropsychological assessment, what will happen is that we'll get a, a snapshot of what we call domain cognitive domains. Um, 
and tests looking at aspects of attention concentration, working memory, so your capacity to manipulate information online. We'll be looking at your memory, so capacity to learn novel information and retain this information over a short period of time. Looking at executive functions, which are your abilities to problem solve, to plan ahead, to monitor, um, and, and have multiple trains of thoughts simultaneously, being able to, to, to monitor that. Also looking at aspects of um, spatial abilities, so your capacity to understand visual information and reproduce um, designs that we show you to do, and obviously aspects of language. And so understanding of language and, and language production. And so that is done in, in many different disorders, not, not well, whenever we want to look at cognition. So it's not specific to frontal temporal dementia or Alzheimer's disease or, or dementia in general. What, what is useful, what is giving us clues about the, the potential causes. So we look at patterns of preserved abilities and areas of concern so where the performance is, is not as good as expected. And looking at these profiles, then we can infer what is the likely cause of these difficulties. And as I was saying earlier, neuropsychology is only one of many blocks of our investigations. So then we take that together with the, the medical investigation, the neuroimaging, blood biomarkers, talking to carers, and, and so on, to put a, a full picture together to get to a diagnosis. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. We might finish. There's no questions coming through the chat, so we might just finish up with this uh, one last question if, if no one else has any questions. Um, so this one is... Um, this person is asking for more suggestions for engaging activities that would be helpful. We struggle to find activities my partner can do. So um, I might ask this one of you, Claire, where, where, how can people find sort of a range of activities? I think they're running out of ideas of, of what a person can do. Yep, so um, put me on the spot. I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but I can send um, it through to Morel to share. There's actually a list um, that researchers have put together that can be used. Um, something like, um, something to do with daily or everyday activities in Alzheimer's disease. And it's just got a whole list of activities that people might enjoy doing um or might have enjoyed doing in the past and it just basically is a prompt list to help people with brainstorming ideas um so i'll send you the link of that i'll send that to morel so she can share it for anyone who's interested in that um but yeah so there is a list that you can go to for ideas other than that i would just say just brainstorm just think about everything that the person um used to enjoy doing before their diagnosis and that things they like enjoying doing now um and just don't discard discount any idea while you're brainstorming put it all down because there's things you could do to modify an activity um, even if you think oh they won't be able to do that there's possible that you could modify the activity in some way so the person could still do it so for instance if someone used to really enjoy doing cryptic crosswords and they're struggling with that now perhaps they could still do a find a word or something like that so that's a quite a similar activity that could be modified so the person could still engage in something that's quite similar so put all your ideas down and just brainstorm and just have a really good think and then think about, is there any way that this activity could be modified in some way to help the person engage in it in, in maybe a new way? Um, that's what I would suggest. But yeah, I will send the um, information about the, um, the list, which I just can't remember off the top of my head. It's by Terry et al. Um, I can tell you the author's names, but I can't tell you the name of it off the top of my head. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. I'll once I receive it, I'll distribute it to people so that they can, you know, almost have like a menu or a whole range of options. Um, so I think that's it for the questions actually that have come through. Um, so we might finish, close the panel there. Thank you so much, um, Olivier, Michelle, Kiri, Rebecca, and Claire for your time um, answering people's questions. And I'm sure. You know, if people have additional questions, I'll, I'll explain in a moment uh, how to contact us uh, for more information. 
Um, but thank you so much, guys. Um, for the, for the close of, of, of this webinar, I'll just alert everybody of some uh, another final um, uh, event that's happening for World FTD Awareness Week. I'll just share my screen to show you this. So World FTD Awareness Week, it actually ends uh, on Sunday. And there's one last event, which is tomorrow, and this is being hosted by World FTD United. World FTD United is, um, brings together all the kind of major FTD uh, clinics from around the world. Um, and so what they are doing tomorrow is releasing a video, which is called Con A Global Conversation in FTD. Um, and it features, uh, researchers, medical professionals, clinicians, um, people with FTD and their families having a conversation about what the main issues are currently in FTD. And I think it'll be really good, lots to relate to um, in, in that video. So finally, I, I just wanted to um, thank everyone for such a wonderful day. Um, I wanted to thank all the speakers and the great presentations. Um, and most especially to Julaine, Jill and Mark, who shared their stories um, this week. And I wanted to thank everybody who attended today and for your enthusiasm with your questions and comments. And it was really great to see that through the chat, um, there was not only questions, but people were sharing uh, their experiences um, related to the various topics. So it was great to see that you know, sense of community in the chat. Um, on the screen here, I've got the, the a picture of our clinic. So these are all the people in front here um, and also all the different ways that you can contact us. So uh, for more information on FTD and resources and things, our website is the best place to go. Um, and of course, if you would like to um, uh, be part of the research and um, also find out more information about FTD in general, uh, you can email us and we regularly post updates on our social media channels on the side there. So I'll stop there and um, wish everyone a good afternoon and thank you again. This is recorded so we will release, I'll provide people with the details of where this will be released and um, where you can access it afterwards. So we'll conclude there. Thank you everyone again and have a great rest of the week. Bye, guys.